So I'm going to put this in parts. Uh, this will be part one, obviously. And just because it's it's longer than I expected, I cover a lot of um, topics in more depth than I anticipated. But I, you know, when I present something, I want to seal the deal. I want to just drop the mic, and I want scrutiny. So I want to make it clear what Out of Africa Three, Out of Africa Three is really. It's just you're taking haplogroups literally. You're not assuming back migration f when you have you know, thousands of people in Africa that have something and you have the ancestor for that um, haplogroup within Africa, when you have that type of uh, basis, you don't assume back migration. So I'm not assuming back migration for the great majority of haplogroups that are found in Africa. Um, with W, I'll give you an example of the exceptions. W, I usually assume back migration just because when you do see it, it's at the coast, it's newer branches. It's a young haplogroup of newer branches. It's young enough to have come right out of uh, out of Europe, to have started and come out of Europe. Uh, I think U is sort of the ancient example of, of an I don't know haplogroup because it's found, it's old, it's found in different locations. It's more of an I don't know, but M, N, uh, are both ours based on the ancestry to those lineages that they came out of Africa and if that implies that it these migrations were more recent then that's what I'm building on this will be part one out of Africa 3 everybody this is mainly for black YouTube because it's one area where you're weak so, I'm just stepping in to help out, really. Uh, the Angel Ramirez video, that best captures the weakness. I mean, this dude gets everything wrong at the beginning of that video, and he's not alone. You know, from the word Caucasian. He says that race is not a social construct. Tell me if you know of anyone who was born with a label saying what they were. He says that Neanderthals were white. I'm gonna say something like that. I'm gonna show you some pigment genes. I can show you some pigment genes. Oh, check that. I did show you a test that showed how Neanderthals had pigment genes that were the same as black people. But this is how you know race is a social construct because the black people were Yoruba. And some sort the other black people were Melanesians. And in some circles, Melanesians are not considered black. In other circles, you can be a black Asian. Other, you know, it, different states, different countries, they have their definitions for race. He says that Neanderthals met Homo sapiens in the Caucasus Mountains. People who are mistaken for being related to Neanderthal based on what I would consider to be a mistake, an anomaly, but the people who have that the most, they're not in the Caucasus Mountains, they're in the islands. As you can see, the fake Neanderthals that were made were created by the same person that did the fake Nefertiti. Elizabeth Danes, don't believe me, look it up. It's part of the same type of propaganda and population genetics that I see through. Angel, step your game up so you can see through it too, but it's a little deeper than that. See, I covered the death in the Tara McCarthy is all wrong video about human genetics. So if you're listening to this saying, what do you know, man? You're not a geneticist. You believe, and, and hey, I cover it. I come to the same conclusion as Cambridge College. That's one of English, England's best schools. I come from it. I come to that conclusion from a different angle. But the exact same conclusion. <laughs> and as I'll show today, I'm not alone. But I have to cover this because 
This ends up being a pretty important aspect in population genetics. Because he mentioned that there was a con strong consensus on the Neanderthal thing. And it's not just me in Cambridge. Now, that's how I'm different. See, I fact check these people. I catch them wrong often. And it's not new, like I've mentioned before. There's a tendency to be wrong about Neanderthals. So what's this video really about? I need to replace the out of Africa model. I need to replace it. I want to replace it with something that's based on evidence without preconceived biases. Let me say this. This is going to be a long video, content rich. Give it, you can give it to your kids. I'm going to try to keep it PG. Okay. I'm going to source mostly everything. I'll make a case. I'll back it up. And you'll see how it collaborates. No hocus pocus. I don't mind being wrong. I want you to challenge this model. This out of Africa 3 model. Because to be real, to be really honest with you, what I'm saying should be in the textbooks already. What I'm saying should at least rewrite the textbooks hundreds of pages on Wikipedia, if not more. But it won't. Population genetics is stuck in a holding pattern. And it's kept up in the air with confirmation bias, race bias, snob talk samboic energy it doesn't progress you can change that you can get on wikipedia and start changing it that's what i urge you to do but first you got to get to know out of africa 3 it's not really that different like if you, if you're a lay person you might as well turn it off now other than the fact that I'll show where Europeans come from in specific, something that people can't do. They can't be specific about it. They can't really narrow it down to some tribal relations. I can do that. You can do that without of Africa 3. Other than that, this is not for the layperson. I'll promote the video to get it out to people who, who really are interested in studying population genetics, people that can challenge me, but I'm just letting you know, because there's not a major difference between Out of Africa 2 and what I'm proposing. But one thing going forward that you'll have to understand is the founder's effect. It's literally defined as a loss of genetic variation that occurs when a new population is established by a smaller number of individuals from a larger population everything out of africa is a model of the founder's effect matter of fact portions of africa are also model models of the founder's effect some of the isolated portions. There are currently two out of Africa models. And they have different permeations. So before I get to the third, I'll, I'll try to go through the first two real quick. Um, here's some of the definitions. I think I'm flashing that up. If not, they're pretty simple. Out of Africa 1 basically is early humans left Africa and separately they evolved into Homo sapiens. Out of, Afri out of Africa 1 is pretty much dead. I won't really spend much time dealing with Out of Africa 1. There's no evidence for multi-regionalism. There are no known haplogroups from non-homo sapiens. So off that right alone, it doesn't work. I mean, the only exception might be A double zero, but there's no way to confirm that because there's no, um, like the only people who have A double, A double zero are modern homo sapiens. You know, that doesn't really work. 
and even and here's the thing like if it's something I'm not firm on I'll, I'll put an asterisk next to it I'll put that asterisk like in the video black Neanderthals and Eurocentrism I wasn't firm on interbreeding and I'll put an asterisk next to that but I did show that they had the pigment genes of people who are classified as black and people who have the same color who might not be classified as black because they live in, Asia, in, live in Asia. In that first video, that video, um, Black Neanderthals and Eurocentrism, I talked to this guy, and you can kind of read our conversation. It was 98% African with 58 Neanderthal variables. And at the time, I knew that they were found in Sub-Saharan Africans in low amount. And I just dismissed that as back migration, back in Africa. But then I examined his tests and I compared it to other African Americans. I noticed that even African Americans who were 23 and Me's idea of being 15% European and like 2% Native American, they had less variants then I think his name is Guyame he put this on his public uh, Facebook so I don't think he, he minds uh, me saying this so but that's his test like you can see his entire test on Facebook and that really isn't a whole lot of Neanderthal variants but the thing is you're not getting that from 2% because there's African Americans who have one Neanderthal variant. You know what I mean? Like, that's still too much. That's probably less than a quarter of 1%. But it's still too much to have come from anywhere but Africa. And, and that is something that chaps me. Because how socially engineered do you have to be to where you're making epithets? based on African genetics, old African genetics, old homo sapien, because they always added this homo sapien African genetics, because if you're going to say it's archaic, then then I learn how to stand upright from penguins. You know what I mean? Like, then you call anything archaic, anything that we share with anything that doesn't uh, post-date homo sapien. So it's still, it's coming out of Africa homo sapien genetics and we've turned it into Neanderthal yeah that's a good video I would suggest watching that video and the other one if you're into this watch those two videos first the Tara McCarthy video and the black Neanderthals and Eurocentrism video you'll see how I evolved but back on subject multi-regionalism it's not really it's not hitting anywhere like David Duke has a multi-regional in Africa hypothesis but it, it's not really it's not moving out of Africa too that's the one that's generally that's generally accepted that's um the problems with out of Africa too are more complex like I said it's unless you're really into details of the subject it's not that big of a difference I think it's definitely big enough to where it needs to be discussed like we should definitely get rid of according to me you know challenge me if you think I'm wrong I think out of Africa too needs to get done it should be done you can't build off of it there's way more information that points to a different model um, most people within out of Africa too still accept the Neanderthal admixture within it and I think that holds it back Big issue though, just jumping out, I'm going to shorten this up some. The big issue with Out of Africa 2 is if you look at the maps, you need all of this back and forth migration. And you need that because, like, the, the common description of Out of Africa 2 is Homo sapiens, they left Africa about 50 to 80,000 years ago. And greeting them when they left in the like in Saudi Arabia, in uh, Israel, where Neanderthals and Denisovans, all of them, 
everybody who came out. And they made love. And then they spread around. Like no group of people left out, isolated somewhere. And we know that this happened because that's what Australians did. Australians left and went out. They were isolated. That's what um, Adam and Island people. But all of them, all of them went through this uh, Neanderthal Denisovan orgy. That's the out of Africa too model. And that's sort of where, well, that's one of the areas where it steers off from critical thinking, critical analysis, and it becomes dogmatic. Because when you look at these maps, hold on, let me pull up. Let me get personal with some of these maps. Sorry, I'm a little... I need to get closer to the mic. What I can see here. When you look at these maps, we'll just deal with the one on the left. You can see the crisscross patterns on the one on the right. right when you look at the one on the left, it would have you think, just looking at it, that L2, L3, M, and L1 are the only lineages within Africa. All of those lineages are found in Africa, except I don't know if you see any Z, I don't see any Y, um, don't see any C. It's mostly you don't see the uh, the ones that are far away, like the Native American ones. But you do see some of those. Like you do have X and A. A is I, I know of a couple instances of A. A is kind of light, but you get the picture. The European ones are all in Africa except for W, I think. So to explain their existence, there you have, and on the right side you have the Y chromosomal map. So to explain their their um, presence, you have to have a back to Africa model where people left, you know, in spite of Africa being that large, you know, they went the distance of the United States, China, India, double that, and then came back. It's like there's no evidence in archaeology, and the evidence from genetics is explained better from just having a relationship with the people that left so people left and they go uh, all the way to Nebraska from let's say Tunisia you're probably not going to be as related to them as if people left Tunisia and went to Italy then you're going to be more related to Italians that's the pattern you, you see. You see that. Um, is a pattern of um, that nature. One other thing. Yeah, I might throw in some storytelling. Because I just watched this video. I'll try to make this quick. With Nia Hope she finds out that she has haplogroup H. Now, as I'll show um, in a minute, haplogroup H is all over Africa. And uh, she was getting African ancestry. And then this, uh, there's a video from uh, Atheism is Unstoppable where they're just making fun of her. I mean, this is a woman who's had her culture yanked from her bear. And in her nakedness, she tries to put on some clothes, figure out who she is. And I hope that she had a European branch of age. And African ancestry can't do anything with it. I hope that's the case, because there's African branches of age. Matter of fact, African Americans brought age to America, too. So there are definitely African branches of age. Age is thicker in Africa. In the location where African Americans came from. H, the, the uh, Europe's most common mtDNA haplogroup, is thick in Africa, West Africa. And that's, you know, she's, she's running into this ratchet in the eighth iteration 
of human rights violations, but it's all coming from the first iteration, her nakedness. A matter of fact, I should just get to it and get to showing it, but there, there's other things involved. It's not just the location of these haplogroups. It's not just HV, the ancestor of HNV in Burkina Faso. The difference between out of Africa 2 and out of Africa 3 is I don't assume back migrations. I let the evidence speak and I'll, I'll reference it and check it and then let it speak again. And in other words, I look at it scientifically. There's a lack of that sort of analysis. We have to have some general agreement that the patterns change. As you can see with 23andMe in the top right, it includes North African values. So, well, it includes, as you can see in 23andMe in the top right, they include, let's see if I even have that up. Yeah, that that's their North Africa. They include like Yemen, Saudi Arabia, um, Oman. I've seen Kuwait in, included, which is like really far from North Africa. I can't find net geos, and I looked. I can't find their definition of North Africa, but I see that they recently changed it. They rolled their previous 14% Sub-Saharan African into new categories. Like if you look at their definition of Egypt, then you can see how it changed. So it looks like the Sub-Saharan African that goes into North Africa just became North Africa. And you can see what it what changed with um their uh Southwest Asia European how that changed. Now also you can see how with their new model I talked about this in my last video Obama's daddy tribe the Luya they're 6% Asian, 4% North African. As you can see in 23andMe in the top right, they include, let's see if I even have that up. Yeah, that that's their North Africa. They include like Yemen, Saudi Arabia, um, Oman. I've seen Kuwait in, included, which is like really far from North Africa. I can't find net geos, and I looked. I can't find their definition of North Africa, but I see that they recently changed it. They rolled their previous 14% Sub-Saharan African into new categories. Like if you look at their definition of Egypt, then you can see how it changed. So it looks like the Sub-Saharan African that goes into North Africa just became North Africa and you can see what it what changed with um, their uh, Southwest Asia European how that changed now also you can see how with their new model and I talked about this in my last video Obama's daddy tribe the Luya they're 6% Asian, 4% North African. Okay, I can kind of see the... Actually, I mean, the Luya in Kenya, that's a lot of North African and Asian, especially Asian, 6% Asian. The Senegalese are 12% North African. That I can see. They're in North Africa. Okay, that makes sense. But 8% European in their new model? Like it's slanted in a way that's pulling sub-Saharan Africa, sub-Saharan African ancestry into Europe and North Africa and Asia, as it appears with the Luya. Kenya is not really that close to North Africa. It's sort of in Central Africa. Now, DNA tribes, more than anybody, they burst it. 
and they show their work. That's one ex um, reason why I like using them because they show that they're basically just comparing their entire population database to itself. And in that sense, they're showing their work. I, I'd say look this up. This is from 2014, 2013. These two studies have two major things going for them. They don't assume back migration. They recognize that Arabia, Yemen, Palestine, the regions that, the, um, that were turned into Israel, those regions are genetic extensions of Africa. I mean, they've, there is uh, an asterisk to that, but in general, there is a climb. And my Out of Africa 3, I, I try to do some maps that are more objective, that shows everything. And you can see that climb. You can see that pattern going from Libya to Egypt, from Egypt to Palestine, from Tanzania to Kenya, to Ethiopia, to Somalia, to Arabia and Yemen. And there's somewhere of a break when you hit the Red Sea, but you can see that pattern. With DNA tribes, you also see that pattern when they compare the population to themselves and that takes out some of the bias where you assume that people are back migrating to a region instead of just saying okay well who are they related to compared to themselves compared to other people out of Africa too is like I said, the consensus model. There is no name for Out of Africa 3. As far as I know, it started with me. I want to present both arguments. And I want to start off with the quotes from geneticists that, uh, where if you listen to them, it does sound like they're where they favor a different model. That's more like Out of Africa 3. Peter Underhill, haplogroup, and this, sorry, this kind of might be a lengthy read, so take a moment, but I want to give you some ideas on where geneticists are and how conflicted they are, how different they sound, okay? This is Tomas, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, I would assume it's Skidisvili, Peter Underhill, Haplogroup CF and DE molecular ancestors first evolved inside Africa and subsequently contributed as Y chromosome founders to pioneering migrations that successfully colonized Asia. While not proof, the DE and CF bifurcation is consistent with independent colonization impulses possibly occurring in a short time interval. Let's throw in another one. This is uh, Pontus Skokoloi. Let me give this one some context. There was a study done on burials from mostly Tanzania, but also Kenya and South Africa. And they found that they were related to Natufians, who was a population in uh, like modern Israel, and Anatolians, which is an ancient population. These are ancient people from modern Israel and from Turkey. They're related to them. A These are the same, this is the same population that produced the articles, same two population that produced the articles saying that ancient Egyptians were related to people outside of Africa. That Sub-Saharan Afri Sub Africans were new migrants. Well, within Sub-Saharan Africa, in this study, which came out like not long after, like months after, the uh, Abu Sir study. In this study, they find ancient Tanzanians, Kenyans, and South Africans that are related to those same Natufians and um, people from Turkey, the Anatolians. So the, the quote explaining this goes as such. This is from Pontus Skokoglan. 
These results could be explained by migration into Africa from descendants of pre-pottery Levantine farmers, or alternatively, by a scenario in which both pre-pottery Levantine farmers and Tanzanian Luxemann in 3100 BP descend from a common ancestral population that lived thousands of years earlier in Africa or the Near East. Here's a quote, quick quote, quote from uh, Sarah Tishkoff. And in the fact that ancestry found outside of Africa is largely a subset of that within it. And, th and that's a quote that's fairly typical of modern geneticists. So they, they kind of talk like that. And you'll hear, um, like, if you look at this video, Brian Sykes has no problem saying that we are all black. You know, he does not look black. I don't know if he should consider himself as such, but that's the um, loose narrative in support of a, a um, out of Africa three model. Another example, the one that I prefer, it's from a study, Kofi Maglu Tesfe um, Marsha. Yeah, Tesfe Marsha. Is that a last name? Lisa J. Martin. Uh, and they offered a report on population genetics. Within that report is a quote, quote, a classification that takes into account evolutionary relationships in the nested pattern diversity would require that sub-Saharan Africans are not a race because the most exclusive group that includes all sub-Saharan African populations also includes every non-sub-Saharan African population. You can visualize that in this picture. You also have a quote from uh, Laura Botigue, I think it's pronounced, and this is mocked up, I'll, I'll just put this out there, by XYY Man. He's another person I could quote many times, this guy. He's a, um, so in a lot of times I'll present his mocks, so if you see that something's edited, it might not be me. Oh yeah, I'll just leave that out there, you can read that. But as you can see, where she says that it's the least studied, that just, that's an example of the ethnocentric bias. Let me see, does she use those exact words? Least amount of attention. Now here are some that are, that favor an out of Africa 2 model. Or some, I'll give you an example that'll favor an out of Africa 1 model. Or one that's not even an out of Africa model. So it's kind of like a mixture of one and, I guess, zero. <laughs> Call it negative 0 0.3 model. Carriers of mitochondrial DNA haplogroup group L3 migrated back to Africa from Asia 70,000 years ago. That's a staunch out of Africa 2 take right there. And there's the abstract on that. this right here and they make their their case for it and they're basing it on a fossil that was dated around 125,000 years ago uh, in I guess not sure exactly where it was found but then you have Ulfer Ulfer Arneson and this is that negative zero model. It says the out of Europe slash Asia into Africa theory of human origins new paper calls for paradigm displacement. And he makes a case based on, let me see here, it says Ulfra Arneson, a neuroscientist at the University of Lund, Sweden, places the last common ancestor of Homo sapiens and Neanderthal. Somewhere in Eurasia, Arneson argues that the ancestor of the African Khoisan and Mbuti populations formed the first exodus of, hum of Homo sapiens into Africa from Asia and Europe. Now, if you listen closely to that, doesn't it sound like maybe Ulfer 
got the memo that Africans have Neanderthal and he had to explain that. That, that kind of sounds like what that's about, is explaining why Africans have tiny portions of the Neanderthal admixture. And this, this study was actually sourced by Dr. Ali Muhammad in the debate with Jabari. You go back and listen to it and he sourced this, this, uh, this study. There's another paper from ResearchGate where, and they're uh, talking about back migration, explaining why different lineages, quote, Eurasian lineages are found in Africa. This paper, it says, since out of Africa, several waves of population backflow from Eurasia towards Africa took place. Genetic data from modern African populations unveil the presence of major Eurasian genomic components in North, cites a bunch of studies, um, and wow, I don't like how this is written because you got to go through all these studies and data to blah 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 respectively. It has already been shown that proper handling of these non-African segments may improve the understanding of of the autochronous African human diversity in some cases, drastically revise our understanding of within African population divergences. And those are examples of what's different. Luca Pagani, um, you've got the, you still have got people arguing uh, against out of Africa, period. I'm going to list seven collaboratives collaborative proofs for out of africa three i'm going to start with what i i began with earlier i keep going back to this let's really look at neanderthal admixture let's hold it to the fire okay being mixed with the people existed for over eight hundred thousand years diverged from Homo sapiens. You're mixed with someone that's 800,000 years diverged from Homo sapiens. That should significantly increase your diversity. Anyone that's mixed with Neanderthal is significantly more diverse than people who did not, or at the very least, if this was a previously bottlenecked population that lost its diversity, it should be more diverse where Neanderthal admixture occurred. That's where it should be the strongest. And the people who have the highest percentages should be more diverse than the people who have the least if they all were previously bottlenecked the same way. Number two is haplogroups. If haplogroups that are more common outside of Africa than inside of Africa are not a product of back migration, then we should see migration patterns with earlier and ancestor branches of these haplogroups leading out of Africa. Um, to best understand what a haplogroup is, just think a lineage that's marked in your, your um, chromosomes. Number three. The relationship with Asian and European ancestry would have to fit a certain pattern. But basically, at least at K equals 3, Europeans and Asians should be, at least East Asians, should be distant from each other, more distant from each other than Africans. And I've shown this to be the case before in another video. For Out of Africa 2 to work, if they're bottlenecking into one population, admixing with Neanderthals and Denisovans, while nobody else is in the Out of Africa 2 model, then that population should be closer to itself. I'm talking about Eurasians than Africans. I've shown that this is not the case. And I'll show it again. Number four. Now, one, two, three, those are logical. Logical reasons why Out of Africa 3 works. Number one, Neanderthal admixture is a mistake. Number two, 
Africa has enough basal haplogroups to where you don't need uh, back migration. Number three, the relationship with Asians, Africans, and Europeans fit in out of Africa 3 pattern instead of 2. Out of Africa 3 is able to do something 2 can't. When you remove assumptions and look at things scientifically, you remove Eurocentric bias. You're able to deduce. And in that sense, it can correct the mistake of Angel Ramirez. It can show you where Europeans came from. It can answer the question that population geneticists pretend is elusive. So the fourth proof is that Out of Africa 3 can answer the origins of Europeans where Out of Africa 2 is still in that holding pattern. Number five, the genetic imprint. Ancient people would need to be closer together with an Out of Africa 3 model. If Asians and Europeans left Africa more recently, then it should have an effect on Africans genetically. Number five, ancient people need to be closer together. Uh, if people left Africa more recently in an out of Africa 3 model, then that means wherever there's a migration pattern, you should see people that are related to people who left. Yeah, number six, it wouldn't just be genetics. You should also see this in culture, linguistics, and technology. Number seven, diverse phenotypes should be native to Africa. And this one, this is what this is the one for for the Amon Ra squad, YK the Truth, Dagger Squad, because they a lot of times they'll see light skin in North Africa and people with some eyebrowish hair on their heads, and they'll say that they're Arabian. And there's some reality to this. Uh, North Africa was invaded, to my knowledge. Arabians have a leg on um, many of the other invaders for three reasons, especially in Egypt because they invaded twice. Um, the Romans and, and British, they invaded once. But Arabs, they invaded twice. Uh, they probably had Medo um, they probably had migrants like Bedouins going back and forth in very ancient times. So they had uh, a leg as far as the culture. And unlike the British, they um, they invaded with without guns at least the first time. So, if you invade a nation without guns and you hold it, you need a lot of people. So those are the seven Neanderthals. So we'll take it from the top. I'm going to go through all seven. Start from the beginning. There are zero Neanderthal haplogroups. Therefore, zero extent lineages. If Neanderthal admixture is ubiquitous, we should see a divergent lineage somewhere. Too many people have it. It makes no sense if, unless you're going to say this is like one Neanderthal and it spread to everybody coming out of Africa, which makes no sense. You would have to say that this was common. If it's common, why do we see old lineages that are alive today, but not one Neanderthal haplogroup? Even Africans have a small percentage of Neanderthal, right? That I showed evidence of. You can Google that. That's easy. Um, some have none. But the thing is, I can find a small percentage of, of a lineage A double zero. I can find A double zero. A handful of people compared to the population of Africa. A handful. A uh, I can find C in Africa. You know, there, there, or A, empty DNA A. You have haplogroups that are very rare in Africa. You have haplogroups that are very rare everywhere. 
you know, because there's there's a single zero in uh, Europe. Uh, I think it probably came from um, just Northwest Africa, Moors, and even though it's a pygmy or, or uh, originated, but it spread to other people, other people. By the time it got to Europe, it was in Europeans who looked just like any other European. They had kind of a different surname, but it goes, you have all of these rare haplogroups, not one from Neanderthals. That does not, that does not work. If everybody has Neanderthal, like everybody outside of Africa and most I think have a little bit of it within and I'm look man we're we're, we're related to Neanderthals you know if, if I were to compare anyone to a gorilla an apple or a deer we're like 99.99% .99 Neanderthal compared to that so the percentage is a um, a pattern of sex but it could be 300 500,000 years ago through a shared ancestor who was more related to the last time someone actually did have sex with someone who was similar to a Neanderthal. Could have been Heidelbergensis, might not even have been an actual Neanderthal, especially if it's in Africa. There's probably somebody that's more related. And that's what the um, Cambridge simulation found. In, is that they um, found that it was from a period before the migrations out of Africa. I came to this conclusion working backwards, where I'm like, hey, if you look at the founder's effect, it's stronger in people who are less diverse. That's the opposite of what you should see. If you have 4%, 5%, 6%, something that is divergent by hundreds of thousands of years you should have the extreme in diversity but that's not the case the people that have the most archaic are the people with the least amount of diversity that shows that we're not dealing with something that's divergent we're dealing with something that's at the root and once it's taken from the root, through the founder's effect, you see a decrease in diversity. You can see this image right here shows how it works. And, and look, like th those poppins, they have the most archaic. The people with the least amount of diversity, that's the pattern. Yeah, and, and in the video, I mentioned Cambridge, but it's not just Cambridge. Back in 2011, you had, and this guy's name is really Guido Barbagiani, came to the same conclusion. Yeah, this is from the American Journal of Physical Anthropology. No evidence of Neanderthal admixture in the mitochondrial genomes of early European modern humans and contemporary Europeans. This is from Bell et al. 2009. Et al.'s and friends. That's all it means. Incorporated EEMH sequences in their analysis, but still failed to find evidence for any appreciable degree of Neanderthal admixture in European MTD and blah, blah, blah. Gockman et al. 2012. These results mimic symmetry signatures of recent Neanderthal admixture contributing to the locus. However, an in-depth assessment of the variation in this region across multiple populations revealed that African NE1 haplotypes, albeit rare, harbor more sequence variations than NE1 haplotypes found in Europeans, indicating an ancient African origin of this haplogroup refuting recent Neanderthal admixture. M-A-N-I-C-A, 2012, 
effect of population, effect of ancient population structure. Quote from this, to investigate this problem, we take Neanderthals as a case study and build, uh, actually, I think this might be the, um, this might be the Cambridge study, but, because it sounds like how they ran the, the simulation. So, anyhow, to investigate this problem, we take Neanderthals as a case study and build a spatially explicit model of the shared history of anatomically modern humans in this homonym. We show that the excess polymorphism shared between Eurasians and Neanderthals is compatible with scenarios in which no hybridization occurred and is strongly linked to the strength of population structure in ancient populations. Number two, haplogroups. Number two, haplogroups. Area mutations. Q is a descendant of K. K is in Africa. Forever. Go ahead, call her. At pretty much the same frequency you see right, elsewhere, along with right, he, which brother? is like the uncle or slash uh, brother. I'm it changes just, uh, in the. Wanted to bring up the point that there, um, it, because Q and mtDNA A are found in Africa, albeit really light that it may be a thing where we're more connected as far as all these migrations they aren't 100 and 150 thousand years old like the oldest migration if you just go by a conservative scale on the age of haplogroups would be i'm thinking like australians and that's like 60 thousand years old so and in the, in the more recent and the successful ones are probably neolithic europeans so I'm doing a vlog on that soon, and I'd like for y'all to scrutinize it because I think that would give us some clarity on why you see cultural simulation uh, similarities because they aren't as distant by like tens of thousands of years. It's more like ten to fifty thousand years, and the ones that are most distant, like the Australians, are the ones that are the most different. You see what I'm saying? So it, you don't necessarily need, because when I was seeing like all these Native American genes and haplogroups in Africa, I'm thinking, well, maybe there's some back and forth trade, but on further examination, I'm not seeing back and forth. I'm seeing just a stronger out of Africa bulk in, the, in, uh, in Homo sapiens. So you see different phenotypes in North Africa that aren't necessarily from uh, people coming in and conquering recently. Because uh, you see this with people who are isolated, like Tunisians that are isolated that aren't mixed with Europeans like that. They don't look like people all over the continent in Africa. They got a completely different phenotypes. Sometimes they do look more like Native Americans than, than Africans on the other side of the continent. So I think it really, it, there might be a more, and I'm going to use a buzzword that I see, a parsimonious example of what's going on where it's these cultural similarities like the, the um the leopard skin and and the and the uh, jaguar skin this is because you know fifteen thousand years isn't as long a time as sixty thousand years so, all right so you saying that you all found hold on hold on hold on hold on you said you found q in africa right some have it, some don't. But a lot, you can look up Q maps on Google Image and you'll see a scrape of Q in Tunisia. Like, you won't see it deep in Africa. In MTDNAA, the only map I saw it was an old 23andMe map, but there was also one study that had it in West Africa. Yeah, so, but if, if, if it's, if it, that, that's an easy study. Because if Q is in Africa, you could find, you could trace just by the sequences, they could tell you when it got there and everything, which were the migration map. That's not difficult, they though. They don't really, like, it, I can't because I, 
like there's nothing out there and i don't have the tools to do it but like in that, there's um i mean one thing i'll say that that uh clyde winters got right is when he said all Afro groups are african well technically speaking i, I think there's some that aren't in africa no but, that's that is yeah. wrong that is totally that's false that's that's that is totally true. false no, beloved wait, 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 no, that's totally I'm false saying that Mm -hmm. By making that blanket statement, mm -hmm. it opened my eyes to saying, well, maybe there's more than I suspected. Because if you just go by... Uh, but hold on, hold on, hold on, brother. Stop, 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 stop for a second. None of them came out after Stop for a second, stop for a second, stop for a second. Do you agree right. that there's something called mutation? I was just going to go there. You beat me to it, Garfield. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. So now if, if mutation exists, what about the mutations outside of Africa? Those are more infrequent than Wikipedia will. No, 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 bro. That's how they. That's that's how that's how we got cute. That's how. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, beloved, beloved. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. That's how we have Q. Q is the the example that you use. Q is not. Q is not. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, brother. Q is primarily in Central Siberia and Central Asia, and among native americans approximately 90 percent of pre-columbian native americans belong to haplogroup group q i don't think q is the best example to use right that's, native right. America. that's that is not hold up bro let me finish hey hey bro 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 hold on hold on bro hold on hold on hold on i'll let you talk i'll let you talk let's give me an opportunity here the point that i'm trying to make okay. to you is that you, when you find, if you find Q, let's, you know what? I'm going to put a haplogroup map on the screen so people could see a map of it. And what you can see with the genetic distribution of it, when you talk about Africa, you got to be careful because I, you would have to tell me what um, particularly um, offset group of Q, I'm using offset, which is not a, um, a term they use. I'm just using that because I'm an amateur at this. Right, but right. but an offset a group, an offset, right, branch, right. So a branch of Q, you'd have to tell me what branch of Q is in, is like when, is, let me give a quick example. It's like the M2869. M269 is in the Caucasus Mountains. That's where it goes back to. That's what King James Roots is in England. They trace his route back to that particular part of the R1B. So he was M269, which is the Caucasus Mountain. So we say, okay, he ain't no African because we do have a R1B that goes to northern, northern Cameroon, which is V88. But we know where that branch left off before the Neolithic period. So I'm saying we could tell Q if it's in Africa how it got there. We can if it's there. You just said it over the phone. I have not seen. I have not. I have not. I have not seen it. Well, I'm looking at. I'm looking at the maps right now, and I don't see it nowhere near Africa. I don't see nothing you to do with Africa. I'm look, I'm look, I'm look. Okay, it's in the so. northern tip. All right, okay. So let me look. Right. I'm looking right now. I'm looking right now. I'm looking right now. I don't see any branch if in some Egypt. Maps don't have it. Okay, okay. There is a, a Middle East branch some right here, L two four five. But L two four five doesn't. I'm seeing where it branch off. It goes into Turkey. Goes into Armenia. Goes into Iraq. I don't see anything in in in, in Africa. I don't. Yeah, I mean, I'll look into it some more. I'll look into it some more. I, I, I just put them out. Now, like even the one with A2, mm -hmm. there's no real study on how A2 is in, in uh, West Africa, but that's the earliest branch in MTDNAA, and it's light. Like, but then again, like... Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Um, Q1 A, hold on, hold on. Q1A2? Right. No, he said A2. Uh, yeah, this, uh, A2 oh, okay. Itself. Oh, okay, 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 okay. I thought he was still on the queue. I, th I thought he was still talking about queue. Okay. All right. So that's what I mean. Like, it could be a model where these these um lineages spread from Africa or at least someplace real close. Because big back, big thought. Um, my big my brother, my brother, again, again, you just made a big yeah, error again. No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You just said that this could have come from Africa, where we already said Q is found outside of Africa, brother. It has nothing to do with Africa. Because it because, hey, no, hey, I don't think. Hold on, hold on, brother. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on don't, interrupt, don't, interrupt don't interrupt yet. Don't interrupt yet. My brother, Q is developed outside of Africa. It's a mutation outside a of mutated, Africa. You know. If you don't agree on that, you don't make. No, 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 no. How it got into Africa is probably through somebody migrating to Africa. It had nothing to do with Africa. I think that's where we're, we're, we're getting mixed up I, now. I, I, it's I a mutation. Hold on. Let me, let me get. Let me get. Let me get. 
No, no, it's not. No, it's not. You know what, bro? No, I'm not talking about you because I don't know about you. No, but but hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Stop, 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 stop. Because you're confusing. We're talking about Q, and you said that Q is in Africa or it comes from Africa or something, and then you mix up another group. Nah. Don't don't worry about it. We're gonna to respond to you, brother. We get back to you. All right. We're gonna to respond to you. I, I would I would group Q is one of the two branches of P1. The sister group, Hapla group, is R. This Hapla group is believed to have originated around the At Altai Mountain, South Central Siberia region area, approximately 17,000 to 31,000 years ago. This Hapla group has over a dozen major subclades identified in modern populations. Moreover, under the major subclades, there are diverse sub-haplotypes. It's found in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and North Africa. Now, when it's found in North Africa, the people normally have like 0.6 of it or 0.5 around that region. That is telling you it doesn't originate in Africa. That's true admixture. All right? That's true people who came back into Africa, who intermingled and so forth. They ain't got nothing to do with Africa, family. This is not an African DNA. It came from outside of Africa. It came back into Africa. This is basic haplogroup science. All right? It's called back migration. Exactly. Siberia mutations. Q is a descendant of K. K is in Africa at pretty much the same frequency you see it elsewhere along with p which is like the uncle or slash brother it changes in the phylogenetic tree r1 the brother of q and i'm not really that hung up on q q i'll, I'll get to q i don't really to me q is a um i would render q to be a i don't know and I'll say why I'm not definitive like Garfield as the origin of Q in a moment. But for now, I'm just saying the ancestors for Q are in Africa at a relative frequency. And he brings up that it's like 90% in Siberia. And that's a mistake. It's a veteran mistake. Like, And it's, it's one of those things where the haplogroup map lies and it doesn't really tell you population genetics because nobody's been in the living no damn Siberia <laughs> you know what I mean like look at Africa how it models in diversity compared to damn Siberia so if anything makes it to Siberia it's going to have a much larger genetic imprint on Siberia because there's not a whole lot of lineages for it to compete with if any and that's also true with Caucasia and all that so a lot of times you can't judge it based the origin of a branch based on what it's doing in no man's land you got to roll it back and when you roll back q and you know and the thing is like um i give him credit garfield credit for saying he's an amateur at this the thing is he's not making an amateur mistake this is the mistake within common population genetics is they make that Africa compared to Siberia comparison, which is, uh, it's not science because you can't make that comparison. You can't compare Siberia to the, the, um, human family tree. I mean, cause Africa is pretty much the tree evident by that. You are seeing a branch of Q in Africa and I'll, I'll, maybe I'll get to how it got there. Cause that to me is, is where I say it's an, I don't know, but I'll, I'll get to why. Clyde is um, was kind of rude to Garfield. And Garfield can be heavily critical of people. So when I say it, uh, and he, he, he was critical of, of Clyde Witters, and I don't think Clyde took it the way he should have. A lot of times it, it, it gets too personal. And sometimes it doesn't with Clyde. So I don't know, you know, but what I, for me to say that Clyde is, and I wasn't really saying that he's right, He's just make you change how you think uh, right in the sense that if you just blatantly say, oh, all haplogroups are African, 
childish albino, what do you know? You could then turn around and, and make a argument for a damn near every haplogroup but D. And you could say D because it's old and DE is in Africa. You could even say it was in Africa before and went extinct. We just haven't found it yet. We haven't tested most of Africa. And then everything else is basically, they'll, they'll take one haplogroup, look for an area where it's plentiful outside of Africa and give it a, a new name, but it's basically downstream from, from the same mutations. And a lot of times they'll be less than 10,000 years old. Of course, there's going to be isolated populations within 10,000 years. Because a lot of, like, some of the haplogroups that I don't mention, like, uh, I think S, N, one of the ends, there's two ends, um, Y haplogroup N. Let me, let me double check that. See, I'm going by assumptions because there's so many of them. But let me do a little real-time test. Y haplogroup N. I'm assuming it's really young because I don't see any examples of it in Africa. It's about 34,000 estimate. So it's not really that that young let me see <laughs> what's the trip though is the ancestor for N N O is in Madagascar so everything just starts coming back to Africa and then before that it's a branch of K and K you, you can't really just go by by Wikipedia I'll get to that I'll show examples of K matter of fact I'm showing one right here because our um, Garfield also mentions that King James traces his uh, M6, uh, M269 lineage off of the R branch. And the R branch is awfully old. That you're speaking of it in terms of mutations is evidence of, of uh, Out of Africa 3. Because if you don't go with that, that mutation, then it's coming right back to Africa. And like, I talked about uh, M269, let me put that up, in my last video, because, and first let me just say this, before I get to M269, King James was white, I agree, um, but M269, that's the branch that I talked about that's off of my own paternal haplogroup. I have a, a more modern European branch that's even more recent. Because like M269, the other way you say it, I think it's R1B1. Let me look it up, man, because I'll just be sitting here. Because, but the more modern European version, you got to add like a whole bunch of little um, numbers and letters that represent branches for it to work. You dig? Like you got to really, let's see, is this early R? No, this is R1. Okay, here we go. It's at the top. I'm just searching for it. Yeah, it's supposed to be estimate time of origin is like five to ten thousand years, and usually they err on the side of age to make it older. And it's R1B1A1A. That I offhand, just offhand, would say, okay, that's a European haplogroup. You're not going to see it in Africa. But I noticed earlier last year. Yeah, we're in 2019, so I got that right. Earlier last year, that there's an instance of it being way down in South Africa in Herero. And then I usually assume, because people know if they have um, colonialists in their lineage. So I see that it was like 8%. Yeah, 8% in Namibia. And that's. A. See, that, that's like, even then, I would say that's kind of borderline. That does, in a sense, scream Green Sahara and back migrations from a higher point in Africa. But the notion that it came from, um, from colonialism, I'm not 100% against that just because it's such a common European lineage. I mean, we're talking 90% in Wales. But on the other hand, 
you go back 6,000 years ago, this could be a uh, like late Neolithic. I don't, I don't even know. Well, they're, they're calling it Neolithic. Yeah. They're, they're saying Neolithic Europe, like Wikipedia. It's M269. It's located in the Sahara and it's in Southern Africa. I'm not 100 that that, because if you look like, and, I, and it was difficult to get to this study. Man, this study is so nested. And that's the thing. A lot of these studies, if you go to the source in Wikipedia, and I got to also give props to whoever put this in, I'm just going to assume that there is a little bit of a John Brown element to Wikipedia. There, It's not just some base Eurocentrism and stuff like that. There is some white folks that are trying to put in some work and be objective they find m269 they're intentionally not trying to test people who are mixed with colonialists but the thing is like like i said it was hard to find it was hard to get into this study man it was hard to get into this study it's just nested and then when i finally did get it it's this blurry image so i'm putting up some links to it and it's it was in the appendix usually they put stuff in um like topics or or field charts or whatever they have a section they won't put it in the appendix so i noticed that that line is also in the koi sign because i mean were europeans coming to africa saying we're gonna kill some people and have sex with bush women like hey i, I wouldn't put it past them because there was genocide there there was colonialism in namibia where this is located, but 8% out of 24 people, I'm not, you know, and, and then they also had haplogroup I, which I would say is, if it is, if it wasn't so nested with its ancestor F in the Sudan, and if I'm on point, I might have some evidence on this, but I don't think I'm going to flash any of this. I'll just show F. F is uh, in Africa. Quiet is kept in spite of the bulk of, of all the uh, genetic diversity that it has to compete with. And I think that's what produced I offhand. When I see I in uh, this branch of R, I do assume that it could be colonialist. Yeah, I think that's possible. But for it to be in Herrero, okay, the Herrero, they got some, they got some honeys. I've seen some cuties. They and they they got a European streak to them. They they like to dress up like Europeans. I can kind of see that. But in in a small population of, of uh Bushmen too, or Bush women I should say, like the uh, the Nama, you know, and then there's also the thing, well, where did some of these light skinned genes come from? Because the Nama are some of the palest Africans you're gonna find. So, and the only reason why I saw it was in the Nama, like you could kind of see it was in the Khoisan from another picture, but I had to go through the motions of opening this thing up and blowing it up because it's blurry. So let me get to it. I mean, I, we all, um, Aunt did also pin this to back migration and let me put this out there now. You, you do have that one, and this is something, let me cover Q before I move on. Wikipedia does have Q in Sub-Saharan Africa in a in an island. Like it's also in Tunisia, and in um in Algeria, I think it is. Yeah, Algeria. So it's in North Africa. Light. It even makes um, and I don't know what he was talking about not being able to see it. It, it may, you can see that it's on on the map. But the thing is. I don't think there's any studies that really look at the branch. I hadn't found one that looked at the branches, except for the one in Wikipedia mentions it, this M346 branch being in Comoros, which is a, a little island between Madagascar and like Ethiopia. Now that branch is sort of in the middle of Q's diversity or it, based on this phylogenetic tree, another one either doesn't have it or just say what, where its starting point potentially is. And to me, that renders an I don't know because it is very possible that Q was 
a lineage in Africa that was overcome by the diversity in ancient times and only exists in an island where it's isolated and in North Africa where it peaked before it left. That is possible. If we could see the branches that are in North Africa, then maybe we could discern it. But the test I have, because the pattern for back migration is newer branches. That's why I'm looking at that um, M26, M269 um, in, uh, in South Africa, funny style. Like, in, you know, even if it's in Khoisan. But like I said, even that, Khoisan are traveling. They mix with some people who mix with some people. You could have an, you can have a Saharan origin. Matter of fact, bet my boots. I'm saying that uh, Neolithic Europe is a escape from the drying Sahara. Bet my boots. And I'll show why. Yeah, sorry, well, I did cover. But let me let me just show. This is the Y haplogroup T diagram. And it's flawed because you can look at where it's heat map. And it's still, I looked all through this thing. I didn't see anything from Somalia, Ethiopia, Tanzania, but you can see where it's located. Maybe Egypt, they might've had it in that, in that uh, tree. But the thing I like about uh, this, this um, haplogroup T, and let me guess the age, see if I can, you know, I try to keep this in my head. I'm thinking it's like 25,000 years old. And I usually go by the low end of Wikipedia estimates because I try to compare it to an overall scale with with the older ones. Yeah, they say 25,000 plus or minus five. I'm going 20. So it's 20,000 year old haplogroup. You can see where it's located. But that's not why I have this picture here. The reason why I have this picture here is you can see with this picture that the the way haplogroups are named. Now, if you look at the ancestors for T, it's LT. That goes back to K. K's existence is old. And instead of just saying, okay, these are all the descendants of K, you could call everything. Q could be K. R could be K. P could be everything inside of K if you were going to hold it to the same age standards as they do with African haplogroups. could just all be K. And K would be all over the place. Every continent. And you go back to the ancestors of K and you, you can go back to F. And that's in Africa. But the point I'm showing with this diagram is to show that the older branches, even if you're looking at a young, like 20,000 year old um, example of a haplogroup tree, even if, if it's this young, you can see that the inner branches are going to be smaller in population. They're going to be more rare to find. I'll stay with paternal haplogroups. With the paternal haplogroups, A, B, D, E, E, C, F, I, G, Q, J, K, P, R, and T are all found in Africa. Not found in a way um, that just screams obvious back migration. Unless you go to the northern coast and you hit up some places where people like came from Europe, you know, um, with their hand up saying, hey, this is where I'm coming from. That does exist. But that's not what I'm talking about. A, B, and E are mostly considered African haplogroups. Though some are more recent, researchers have ar tried to argue for an Asian origin for E. Just looking at the phylogenetic tree, let's look at E. Okay, it's, that's E right there. You can see its oldest branches are in Ethiopia. And then it's in North Africa. This is key right here. And let me say, even before we go there, the basal branch for, for E is DE. So if you go before this, if you go before E, 
E1B, and I'm, I'm going with E1B1B because it's located outside of Africa to a great extent, but it, with the same pattern. The basal branches for E, DE, are in Nigeria and South Africa. There's, there's plenty of examples of that. There, it's not high frequency because it's old as hell. D is old as I don't know what. But you can see like right there is showing up in South Africa. The ancestor for E. And then this branch of E becomes big in Ethiopia. Then one branch goes in North Africa. Then the Mediterranean. Red Sea, you see North Africa again, and then when you get to the branches at the bottom, you got the European branches. Now look, there's a European Europe has some old, bran old branches that are older than that, but back migration would mean that those newer branches, which are more common in Europe, would show up. If you find in K in Africa, you can't say that this was brought from Europe unless you got some of them new branches. And you don't really see those new branches from Europe, which is the mark of back migration. Or, or even if you look at those new branches on the right in the Middle East. And look, like the branches with the Middle East are right next to South Africa. And the Maghreb, which is kind of why you see a distance between people... Um, who are, who look European, the Maghrebians, and Europeans, if, if they're not, if they're not having sex, you know, like there are places where, like in the Maghreb, Morocco, where Europeans have come and 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 love has been made. I hope, and and that's what you end up with: the people become closer. And again, the reason why I chose this image was to show that early branches, no matter how you're looking at it, it could be A double zero, it's found in a handful of Africans. That's what percent of Africa? What percent of A double zero is Africa? So that it, it would have been found if it wasn't for African Americans getting tested so much. It was first found in an African American. Yeah, let me stay with paternal haplogroups with uh, with that E following a follow genetic tree there. Now with E and DE, you have incidences of both, well, of DE in Nigeria, North Africa, and Southern Europe. This is also true with R, P, K, and F. Supposedly, though, they're changing R, so it's a later branch of P. Or, or now P is R1. That seems to be how the new phylogenetic trees are doing. R, as you can see, big in Europe, Central Africa, lightly scattered around Africa, other parts of Africa big in Western Asia, and big in the Americas. G is mostly North African, but it's also found in pygmies. Now C is interesting. I could find one study where it was found in Africa, but Net Geo quietly has it on their heat map. And they even say in their blog that it came out of Africa. And I, to even get that, I find that blog, I had to do a reverse image search. It was not a publicized article with them showing um, C coming out of Africa, but they could have been generalized, and I don't know. But it shows this is how you know that Abo's got a problem with Africa. Because they could have used that to say that Africans traveled to the Americas. But see, like, like right there with that heat map, man. No back migration arrow. F is found in Africa too. And also notice that it has a, a um, binary. A, I'm going to say binary. It has it has a, a migration that's going towards the east 
to the Americas. Not all the haplogroups have that. And like I was saying, F is also found in Africa. This is a study from Jana Bukova. Took haplogroups from the Sahel, and you can see CT, F, P, kind of an unknown R, and lots of R1B. The R haplogroup is one of the few, when you look at it, haplogroups that appear to have reached the Americas from the east, from the northeast. Same with X, which is a branch off N, and that kind of makes you wonder what's up with N. Did it, how did N get to the Americas? And, and it makes you wonder, like, how did sickle cell get to the Americas? Are all the, the mtDNA L branches uh, post-Columbus, like runaway slaves? And these are the type of questions that aboriginals could have examined, but they want nothing to do with Africa. So they don't, they don't bring this up at all. And when I look at the phylogenetic tree, R does the sa same thing as E. It does not appear to back migrate. The ancestors to R, P, K, F, C, T are in Africa, and the earlier branches are more prominent. And here are some more examples with the sources. R, P, K, F, C, T, B, T, D, E in Africa. Nigeria, deep within. And, and the Africans that have these, and let me also say, K once you get past R, we're talking old lineages. So they aren't really hitting hard elsewhere. So there's no real frequency advantage outside of Africa once you go back that far. The only exception is D. And that begs the question, well, if you don't find D in Africa, why do you find everything else except for uh, Y-D-N-A-L? And the Africans that have these lineages, the R's, or whatever... They're more related to Africans that they live next to. Like if you look up the Fang people, they're not alone. But DNA Tribes has them as 99% West and Central African. When it's just Mbuti, Basque, South India, Chinese, and Mesoamerica to compare them to, they cluster with out of Africa groups more. Be it like if you look at R... The, the common branches in Africa are, are pretty early. That's like one of the earliest branches off R. What's interesting, though, is like if you look at the Fang, they're closer to Asians, like the Indians. They're closer to the Asians than the Europeans. So if they're inheriting all of that lineage from Europe, why are they closer to Asians? That shows that they're not. And the lack of K, period, shows that it's strained through this phylogenetic tree. This is where it's going. This is another example that doesn't follow um, back migration. This is what they, I had mentioned to Garfield. If you look at Tunisia, they do kind of look like Native Americans. So, but I'll cover that when I get to what do North Africans look like. What are North Africans? Now, and the thing is, like, I had seen that study on Q where it was found in North Africa. Because that, that's one that's referenced. I don't know what else that is generating that heat map. It looks like it's coming from Tunisia. The study, and let me put that study up. Yeah, the study. And, here, and see here, right here, you see that it's uh, the European branches the ones that aren't in africa are the ones that are newer more recent but q these native american genes are scattered all around you see it in egypt right there with q being in egypt you saw with the other map with with c but look with dna consult consultants saying that um african originated strs were in mayas now this is like forty thousand years ago right but these STRs were in, in, in um, these Native American, well, they say African-originated STRs were in Egyptians and Mayas. Now, unless, because 
these STRs, I could be wrong about their age. I'm thinking like 40,000. They're old, right? Now, if, if you're going to say Egyptians were, were going to America, setting up shop, my problem with that is I'm seeing out of Africa patterns that you cannot pin on back migration. These genes, these Native American genes are in Africa because the haplogroups are in Africa. And we're talking, um, this was in the Armana family. The, the, this DNA consultants, they're talking about, actually, I think this might be modern Egyptians where they have it. But even if you look at some of the other, like, like, like if you look at the chart, this is a very, this is very important. Listen, quiet, <laughs> be quiet while I'm talking. The graph shows genetic continual cores with Africans having all percentages of everything. Continental cores, I said continual, including Mesoamerica blue. It's from DNA tribes. And you see this where their SP breakdowns too. They got a little bit of, of Mesoamerica. And that's the thing. These are we we typically don't have to go back to um, where mutations occur. We just look at frequency and mutations. So even something that's um, African originated, like the STRs from the DNA consultants, it's, it's how it shows up in Native Americans that define the population, not if it shows up in, in Native Americans or Africans. Most of what, sh what shows up everywhere is in Africa. But it's not, it doesn't show up in the same frequency, in the same combination. And there's, you know, different levels of exclusiveness. But that's the thing, like, like when um, Garfield said, you know, what about mutations? You're typically not looking for exclusive mutations as much as you are the way they combine with each other. Now, exclusives can, can be part of it. But usually when they're looking at exclusive mutations, at least what I noticed with STRs uh, with our mono family, when I studied those, the things that made the um, like King Tut's family stand out strong with Central Africa was they had exclusive uh, pygmy and Khoisan markers. They had stuff from everybody. You know, they, they existed as you would think North Africans betwixt um africa europe they had stuff from everybody but what would have made them show up strong with sub-saharan africans was they had markers from recent pygmy and multiple types recent and people say well they, they weren't short okay i've had somebody run that one at me dude everybody has pygmy markers and that's the thing most like with genetics everybody pretty much has close to the same thing it's the percent of a small handful of exceptions. You get out to Australia and, and all them places, and then these lineages will blow up and they'll have all the diversity in the last 30,000 years. Nobody's arguing with that. I'm talking about where were they early? And what do you see on the phylogenetic tree? Because that is substantiated when you see these STRs and you see that Africans are like, um, zero to 1.5 percent Native American. It's not, and I used to entertain that it could be people coming back and forth and all that. That's not. No. I mean, I will say though that the um, the way Africa is modeled as the the Homo sapien family tree with damn near all the branches, it does make it difficult to identify, well, what if there was back and forth trade in ancient time and people from the Americas came to, to Africa? And actually, the, the Abos do cite some evidence of that. I just don't think it's, I think it's overplayed. Completely overplayed. To the point where, like, I know a, um, I know a woman who did a 23 Me test and she was almost all Portuguese. But she was 1% Native American. And she's thinking because they brought some Native American slaves. And I'm thinking, no, it's just the substructure of ancient Portugal. That you have those old sea lineages 
types of C lineages, maybe A2, and they go up into Portugal. Now, if you look at this chart at the bottom, and this is, like I said, this is very important. You see that Mesoamerican. Now, if you look at Ramses III's MLI scores, he had a stronger match with the Salishan and Matismo in America than Arabians right across the Red Sea. That's the difference with STRs and SNPs. SNPs, I doubt you would see anything like that. But STRs are more, hey, do you have that same pygmy? You know, it's it goes back more to, to the substructure. It seems as if, like if you look at uh, the STR tests on Egyptians compared to Abu Sir, that STR favors where you came from, while SNPs are favorite who you're, who you're mixing with. And that's always been the case. Like if I take an, I've took, well, I took a DNA tribe's STR and SNP test. My um, STR test don't tell me what I mix with worth a damn, but it probably gives me the best indication of what tribe I came from. Now, if you look at the, the Egyptians that were tested, they, they hit strong with the, the Somali, they hit strong with, with, with the Karamajong, but it's really difficult to even say with that who they, they come from other than the objective pygmy genes that are exclusive to pygmy. So, you know, and, and damn, everybody has some pygmy substructure to them. And they also had it with, um, and that, that goes back to, I did a video, The Truth About Ancient Egyptian Genetics. That might be one to, to get into before, um, to better understand out of Africa 3. And now let me get to the mtDNA. This is mtDNA A. And you see it in West Africa. This is the one where Clyde was, was looking at him. He pulls out. And then he said all the haplogroups are African after that. I, I, that's why he said it. I bet that's why he said it. He was, he, he was like, I'll be damn a Mende woman with mtDNA A. Ain't no one I'm not going to find. And really, it's only a handful that you don't see, at least in, you know, in the minuscule amount. But I tell you what, all of them are bigger than they double know. So that's the thing. you got to really keep context. And you have to um, factor proportions. Because of just how ridiculously diverse and how much competition there is in the human family tree as opposed to Siberia. You know, like I'm talking the difference between Siberia and Africa is if a flower dropped off a leaf off of a tree. You know, maybe even a flower, a leaf or a flower. Depending on where you're at in Siberia, because it must be someplace where people stick around. Hey, and if you get used to living with seals, <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna 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 uh, judge you if you get used to living with seals I, i'd probably have a lot of fun playing with the seals now here's the earliest you go, go back to uh the ancestor of a is n now i showed you in earlier with that that map that uh that had all the l's with uh n and m now this is from jenny genie they're a genetic ancestry company this is their heat map for n and that's the one where I look at it and I'm like, how did that get to the Americas? Because you can barely see it. It's in Brazil. Were Berbers traveling to the Americas? Were early Europeans? I would explain R going in that direction. I would explain early Africans. Well, with the one in Brazil. But you don't see the, the male lineage. And it's light. But I, I do wonder. And if you look, A, A2, the one that's found is about, as, that's the earliest branch of A. Anything earlier is N. And N is in Africa. Ancestor for N is L3. L3 is all over Africa. You know, and this is what Wikipedia says about N. It says the rare basal haplogroup N star has been found among fossils and the star basically means undifferentiated. Found among fossils belonging to cardial and 
epicardial cultures, cardium pottery and pre-pottery Neolithic. Basal in star now occurs its highest frequency among the Sikorti. The Sikorti, I think, are in Yemen, offhand. In star means unidentified, but they're calling it basal when they're talking about Asians having it. They next say unidentified haplogroup N is especially common in the Horn of Africa, constituting around 20% of maternal lineages among Somali. It's also low frequency among Algerians and Regubate Sahari. So N undifferentiated is not basal, it's unknown, which typically does mean it is basal or it's early, but not always. It's just, they um, call it something different, um, but I'm not, you know, whatever, because at least they, to me, it's more like they cleared it up, but it's not, when they, by calling it basal, technically it's not. It, it means they don't know where to identify it on the scale. And N is a relatively large haplogroup, even though it's cut up because it, it's uh, it's mostly out of Africa. So even though it's it's L3, it's so to make it something else, that's how haplogroups are named. You have to give people uh, nice things. I, I like to say, to simplify it, because I, I remember I was talking to... Um, somebody who just couldn't get over it like i mean she just couldn't get over it n is l3 ah, i'm forgetting her name was it yeah it was matakita i talked about her in, in my last video but yeah n is l3 it's a branch off l3 given different names to identify populations because it left africa Digital Commons has a copy of, ans of an ancestry study on unmarked graves in Georgia of an African graveyard. And here's a link to that. It shows African Americans brought U and H to America. And that should come as no surprise. This is H in Africa. And if you look, there, there's another study with the source below it. Africa at, its, at a high percentage. It has an ancestor. Right, and you can look at a source below it. This is ancient Africa, excuse me. If you look at the study on the left with the source below it, it is in Africa at a high percentage in Burkina Faso with HV. HV is an ancestor to H and V. What the study in the middle shows is North Africa. North Africa has the most diversity of H. So you have the ancestor to H in Central West Africa and the most diversity in Africa along with the highest frequency. And Wikipedia doesn't even entertain this because we're not editing it. That it, Like, you look up Wikipedia and it'll say it didn't start in Africa, but the ancestor to H is right there. Hi, I mean, in this for an old um, basal haplogroup like HV, that's awfully high frequency out of the people that were tested. And there needs to be a reckoning. That's why I'm doing this. Now, examples of M and mtDNA are in Africa. Here's some studies that have that. They find these Afro-European haplogroups in the Americas. They are dismissed as slave runaways when they're found in the Americas. And I don't know. I haven't really studied it that deep. But there does seem to be a lot of those um, North African haplogroups in the Americas. Just saying... What exactly went on? What's going on there? I don't know. It's just, it's interesting because the, the um, abos would rather, instead of using that, they'd rather argue the DNA is a hoax. Well, let's keep it going. I think that's pretty thorough. That's a lot of instances of these, quote, out of African haplogroups all through the phylogenetic tree. If you look at the, um, like, number... Let's see. I'm, it's going to be hard to summarize number three because it was a mouthful. So I'm going to not re repeat what I had to say. I'm just going to put some admixture charts and let you see for yourself. Okay, getting to number three. One in the bottom right shows 
that certain Africans are more related to out of Africa populations than African populations. The red is French. You can see K equals two. You know, all the others are African populations. But you can see there are times when people have more red than they have other colors. And that means they're more related to the French in that, that admixture comparison. Now this is showing up like this. You're seeing this with groups that are deep in Africa. Like these, like with the ones on the uh, right side, a lot of those are Khoisan groups. And like with the Nama, the ones that had that M269, they're kind of in the middle. And you see that even farther down, they have that red ad admixture. You see, I gotta zoom in. I wanna see if these are those exact groups. Yeah, the Hadza. They start to really bleed more towards French. And that right there, those are the ancestors to the French, the Nama, them too. So that they have those, that M269 haplogroup, I'm, hey, that's, I don't think there's a, there's a real known history of mi mixing with Bushmen. I think it's just a matter of Bushmen being isolated, not mixing with other Africans. So they're more related to an out of Africa group. That's my story. <laughs> Sticking with that, because that's especially true with Hadza. Hadza are really isolated. The Nama, they were colonized, so you, who knows right there. But again, there this colonialism wasn't that long ago. So they, when they test people, they're testing people and they're saying, "Hey, we want to know who you're related to." Hey, we're not trying to get people who are our descendants of colonialists. <laughs> we want. We want raw deal Africa. So if that's what's going on, they need some sample schooling because their their sampling is pretty weak. If if you're testing like uh, thirty African and you're getting four colonialists, you gotta step up your free throw percentage. That's pretty bad. And that's I don't think that's what's going on. As odd as it may be. You know, like even notice the Bantu and Central Africans on the left are more related to the French than they are some of the uh, Khoisan and when you first started off. Because some of the Khoisan are completely isolated. And right, let's go to the next. In the top left, you have a chart. You have K equals to Japan and East Asia clusters with Africans. So this goes against out of Africa 3 to an extent. The thing is, we don't know the proxy for Africans. If it's Nigerians with DE, they might be closer to to uh, the Japanese because that's the ancestors to D, and that's a lot of uh, Japan. Um, when you look at the other charts, they name the populations. When you look at the chart in the top right, it's out of Africa 3 to a T because... Uh, um, the French are more African than the Africans, and that's it. Uh, you can see Europeans cluster with the Africans. Even the Japanese cluster more with Africans because Africans have red and the dark yellowish color. And the Japanese are all um, yellow, or I don't know what color that is. The exception is the Eastern Europeans, like the Kalmyks, they mix with the East Asians, so they're going to be closer to Asians. The chart in the bottom right has the same thing. All three charts are proof of out of Africa 3. Because even in the one on the top left, Europe and East Asia are closer to Africans than each other at K equals 3. That's not a pattern of pipeline Neanderthal admixture or some ubiquitous type of out of Africa migration. Now this is haplogroups if you take them literally and you don't spin or assume. That's what you would see it out at um, without Africa three is those type of patterns. And that right here is the largest, like right here. This is as big as population admixture charts get. And up close, it says the same thing. I mean, you don't see it until K equals three, just like the the previous example. There is a population before Africans, but you'd have to zoom in. I don't know what the source for that is. 
I should put that. That thing is huge. I don't remember where I got that from. But it, anyhow, like I don't, I these are easy to find. Most of them. This one was kind of rare. I had to snoop that out. The big one, but the other ones, those are easy to find. Like that's that's nothing. But that does show. All of these do show that once you get to k equals three and you start comparing to more populations and sometimes even at k equals two europeans are more related to africans than they are asians asians are more related to africans than they are europeans and that is a that's consistent with an out of africa three model that's not consistent with everybody leaving a hundred or or fifty thousand years ago in two two waves and going through the same Neanderthal pipeline. Now, number four, how can out of Africa three deduce where Europeans came from in parse North African ancestry? That's the question, really. And this, again, this is for Black YouTube, for Deidre McIntyre. You know, because it's interesting, I was um in, I was debating Deidre McIntyre about the way ancient Egyptians would be depicted because I'm with the movie script and all you know I assumed I would be debating people classified as white saying that um, I'm blackwashing them or whatever but here I am saying that North Africans are probably lighter skinned than we give them credit for and add features that are more like modern North Africans than we um, typically reckon and I'm going back and forth with Deidre McIntyre to make a long story short because I don't really want to get into reliving this one, even though it is interesting. Uh, but there's a reason for this. You know, and like, I don't necessarily get in the mainstream where they use Sub-Saharan ancestry as a proxy for all of Africa. I'll let North Africa speak for itself. And this homogeneous nature, it's marked and it shows that they are more likely to be indigenous to the land than to have migrated from somewhere else. Most North Africans from Egypt to Morocco, and like I said earlier, it does sort of change with Egypt because Egypt's been gentrified and invaded, but they share an ancient North African ancestry. And you can see this, like we go back to DNA tribes for the SMP comparison. All of North Africa, with the exception of Egypt, has its strongest relationship with North Africans. You can see the amount of Arabia increasing as you get towards Arabia. You know, and I'm not gonna say all of the Arabian in Egypt is um recent invasion, but I mean the one thing about Arabs is they're the only people that I know that invaded Egypt three times, really. I say twice, but probably more like three times, if you include the Hyksos, because a lot of that was coming from people who were um I think that was coming from what's modern Palestine, but they were in league with people from other places, including where people were related to Arabians would be. Even though there was no Arabia at the time, like there was no Arabic language, no people who say, yo, I'm an Arab, just like with, with Berbers. But there were people who would be related to Berbers of today at that time. Like Berbers are not a lockstep newcomer to Africa. They go way back. That genealogy goes way back. Also with Egypt, you notice the high Mesopotamian, Arabian, Iberian, and West Asians markers too. That's they were invaded by Turkey and, and Mesopotamian. And so in Iberia, you, you see Iberian too. Rome. Well, part of, partial Rome. And I'm thinking Iberian might be. Uh, or the Med, you know, because Iberia, that's Spain, so I'm not sure what um, Iberian may be, but I mean, it's one to three, two point two percent. I would expect more of an Italian presence. Maybe that's what that Mediterranean is. Northwest Europe is distant, even though the British did invade e Egypt too, but they did with guns, so they didn't have to bring as much manpower. When you look at my haplogroup map, Asians, 
Asia, Southern Palestine, Saudi Arabia, and Yemen are direct extensions of Africa. That's why I believe DNA tribes initially and other companies combine, like DNA tribes did it initially, they combine Sahara and Arabia into a MENA category, like Middle Eastern, North Africa. And remember, the sea does not spill into the ocean, or it did not. You have the Suez Canal, but before that, there was no line where Africa ended and Asia began. And I have another theory as to why these companies combine North Africa with Saudi Arabia. Let me back up. Let, let, let's first unpack this. Let's try to parse this North African. Because North Africa and Arabia were once combined. So take note on what changes. When it was combined and then it was parsed out. Look at the Mozabites and the Canary Islanders. Don't draw any conclusions. Just, just look at it. Have some fun. Look at Egypt, Sub-Saharan Africa. Remember how Egypt went from 14% Sub-Saharan African to zero in that geo? You see the same with DNA tribes when they combine North Africa with Arabia. They did that. Leluia and the Senegalese become more European. But, you know, it's ironic that DNA tribes... But the same company that a racist Wikipedia moderator took off of Wikipedia because they published an Egyptian ancestry test. This company spelled out where Europeans came from. But look at the Mozabites. Look at their relationship with Europeans. Despite their phenotype. Start from the top. Look at Algeria. Look at the European section. The only North African that is heavily related to Europeans are the Canary Islanders. Where are the Canary Islands? In that video, The Truth About Ancient Egyptian Genetics, I talk about how Doug Weller yanked DNA tribes off because of the King Tut test, right? Yanked them. They, I mean, they were DNA tribes was, had their own Wikipedia page. Everything was taken down. All the times they were cited, except for the ones they missed, were taken down. And in that video, I studied DNA Tribes' database. I reviewed their algorithm that they used to come up with their match likelihood index scores. So I'm, I know what I'm looking at well enough to understand the flaws. And this is not one of them with what's going on with the Canary Islands. Like if you look at the Canary Islands, and I encourage you, download this. Just look up DNA Tribes SMP test 2013-2014 because these Canary Island haplogroups are from indigenous graves of, of uh, native burials. And I'm conflicted with the uh, Canary Islands because it's complicated. They were, I mean, well, to put it simple, you have statues in the Canary Islands that look like Europeans. You have recreations that look like Europeans, but who, who did the recreations, and they kind of look like Berbers. The mummies look kind of like West Africans slash Berbers, because they seem to have uh, more West African features, uh, except for the hair. So, <laughs> um, and the haplogroups are more West African Berbers. The SNPs are more European but not entirely new European. And that suggests that it's not just a matter of Europeans using Canary Islands in the same way that they did in recent years with merchant based in Spain. And that suggests it's not just that maybe it was a, a Spanish Armada merchant base and a, a slave base. It's, it, it may be more with the Canary Islands. I tried to find DNA tribes as a sample and all I could see was they sampled 238 people. There are older tests where they're sampling burials, and those were the, like I said, the haplogroups tend to be more like a mix between Berber and West African. The thing that steps out also with DNA tribes, they're related to Europeans in a way that's more diverse. The same thing you see with uh, other regions that have high interdiversity in Europe. I'm talking about places like Spain, Italy, and Turkey. There's a lot more I could cover with that. The Saharawi, I think that's how you pronounce their, their name, instead of Saharawi, Saharawi. 
they're telling. Also, very diverse phenotype. They, you know, kind of all you can have North African within one group of people. So I tried to pick an example of, of um, like a dark skinned girl, light skinned dude, high yellow um, cyst on the left, and some kids kind of look like um, upper Egyptian kids, lower Egyptian kids, both. Matter of fact, it wouldn't surprise me if they if those are, and I I, I got the wrong picture because they look a lot like like Middle Egyptian kids. And well, you see the same with Mozabites and all the North African populations except for Egypt. Now, here's the thing. There's enough diversity in Central and Southern Africa to account for the lineages in North Africa. They can become homogenous, and then you would think they would project more towards Europeans if Europeans are coming out of Africa and they're going in the same direction, but they stop and Europeans are a subset lineage of them. The indigenous nature of these North Africans, and notice how they're not related, regardless of phenotype, not heavily related to Europeans, not putting this phenotype on back migration, okay? Especially because when, in a recent test in Tophara, and that's it above, below the Strait of Gibraltar. 14 to 15,000 year old burials. Hard to get much more North African than this location. Only the tips of, uh, of Tunisia and Algeria are more North African that, than that. And in this distant chart, only the, tips in, of, um, only the tips of Tunisia and Algeria are more North African. And in this distance chart, Tafarot are betwixt the Far and Yemeni but to project more towards ancient Europeans and North Africans. The narrative in the study claim they are between North Africans and Sub-Saharan Africans. Let me repeat that. It says they are between North Africans and Sub-Saharan Africans. Modern North Africans and Sub-Saharan Africans. That's the North Africans from 14,000 years ago. You see that they're most closely related Tafara uh, to Afar. Also, Yemeni is kind of close too, but they're projecting in the direction of Europeans. This demonstrates what I predicted. Ancient North African ancestry projects more towards European groups as Europeans are primarily and majorly a subset of North African ancestry. So they project towards Europeans though they are closer to the Africans, like the Afar. And, you know, after the Afar, you got the Yemeni, who are the most Africanized Asians on the planet. West Africans are near equal distance, similar to the way they are with modern North Moroccans. You know, there's also kind of a lack of samples, but I digress on that. There's, there's some other groups that I wish they could have sampled. And look at the admixture chart. K equals 11. Tafarot becomes ancestral to Natufians in a way that suggests that there is some missing population that is similar to the far. And I recognize that brown component and this yellow component, which I might discuss near the end, as being ancestral to North Africa. And yeah, I know the Berbers are, are Greek for barbarians, nationless wandering people who were foreigners in their area. They, they were foreigners from the perspective of Egypt. So again, I'm talking about the ancestors of people they were talking about. You know, just trying to parse that core North African ancestry. And what better way to do it than to look at some uh, North Africans from 14,000 years ago. I think when Deidre McIntyre was talking to me, her main issue was phenotype. Not, you know, she'd been fine with Tafarol. But notice Luxmanda, the, from the ancient Tanzanian burials, is estimated 5,000 years ago. They appear to be an ancestor at K equals 11 because they have the most diversity and the same brown component. So 
so that's the thing like if you look at the haplogroups for Tafarot they're mostly regional like U is a North African haplogroup U6 is common in West Africa E1B1B North Africa it's in if you look at the uh, phylogenetic tree or the phylogeny M1B out of L3 Africa So these Afric these these haplogroups are like even U6 they're more frequent in Africa than outside the ancestors of these haplogroups are within Africa. There's no reason to assume that they're not from Africa. And these are still North African haplogroups, Southern European haplogroups. There's no reason to assume that these aren't from Africa. U is found all over. With, you know, U6 is most common in Africa. U is kind of a, to me, it's a haplogroup that is just Afrasian. Like, it, it's so borderline, it, I'm not finna to argue about where U can have. U is kind of a, to me, it's a haplogroup that is just Afrasian. Like, it, it's so borderline, it, I'm not finna to argue about where U came from. You know, U is... You could be right on the border of Palestine and Egypt. You could be southern Italy. It could be Algeria. It could be west. It, and it's old, so it had time to travel. And technically, it's still just a branch off of, of uh, L3. Yeah, it's, it's, um, I think the oldest instance is in Siberia, but that's... He, like or somebody was tested near Siberia but that's a branch that's kind of divergent that you don't see in Africa anyway like you mostly see other U branches so not an instance of Siberian back migration anyway it's a it's a a lineage that goes in multiple directions there was a study on haplogroup U by Candela L. Hernandez that reviewed the phylogenetic tree for you. In that study, they entertained that L1 and U entered Europe together instead of L1 and L3, with L3 turning into N and M before R and then U. U is such a North African haplogroup that the idea that it broke its haplogroup R into Southern and Eastern Europe to West Asia mutated and came back to Africa isn't far-fetched. It's very much on the borderline. An old U clad was found in Europe like 25,000 years ago. So either way, I don't think either is likely or the other is likely. U is one of the on the bubble, I don't know, haplogroups because the ancestor for U, R, is prominent in East Africa. And I'm talking mtDNA R. So the notion that an East African group like the FAR, who are related to North Africans, related to Tafarot, brought R or U into West Africa, it's sound too. Either works. You know, that's why I'm kind of on some odd on knowing, because European Sarah lineages with ancient Berberish North African ancestry. You don't need for Europeans to have left Africa. Like, it either works. They don't, you don't, because that the branch that went out pretty much stayed out there. The branch that was found in Europe 25,000 years ago. So you really don't need Europeans to have gone up to the cold lands, cooked, and came back. Their lineages are through Berbers in Africa anyway. And English and Germans aren't really related to Caucasians like that. Humans, as you can see, are not cold adapted. If these skinny women right here, if they don't, if they don't jackets fur for a jacket, then they're going to freeze to death. All of them are going to freeze to death.
Yeah, they're not cold adapted. If this is your idea of cold adapted nature, then people classified as white need a refund. If you look at it, the proportions of European ancestry, the majority is coming from a farmer class. Now, not all necessarily, not all of them necessarily were farmers, but it is a class that is so recent that it incorporates farmers. So they'll call it early European farmers. This is of the Neolithic. So you're seeing that projection with Tafferal. Even though Tafferal doesn't really have a European ancestry outside of splitting from Berbers. Lack of a better term, ancient North Africans. Ancient Mina, Middle Eastern North Africans. So that genetic closeness that you see with North Africans, it's felt with Central and West Africans in the past. For real, like this is um, this is addressed by Skokoglin in a. Let me just read from the slide. Recent study it says proposed evolutionary models for African genetic structure. A. Western African groups have ancestral ancestry from a basal Western lineage. The major source of Western African ancestry, WA2, is more related to Eastern Africans and non-Africans than Southern Africans. Khoisan. West Africa populations have gene flow from populations related to both Southern and Eastern Africa, supporting a more complex pattern of isolation by distance. And that is a picture of the model. Give that to the We Was Kings crowd. And this is really, this is in line with uh, most West African stories about where they came from. They talk about migrating from the east. This is in line with the GPS that I took. But then even the WA1 is also evident because you have West African groups that were in at West Africa for a while before. I mean, that's maybe the oldest people when you consider that's where A00 is found, first found in an African American. But the majority of ancestry is migrating from the east. That's why they're drawing a picture that's coming out of the Sudan mostly and that's the same thing you see with um, and they'll list all the areas with uh, like Balanta oral history they say they came from the Nile the area of the Sudan Egypt and Ethiopia I'm going to take a hard direction change. Let's go in to number six. Start with lactose intolerance. An article from the American Journal of Human Genetics. They find that Fulani have the oldest instance of lactose intolerance. Around the same time, it emerged outside of Africa. And instead of saying it arrived, with shared lineages, since Fulani are related to North Africans and share haplogroups with Europeans, they cite a study that says that Fulani have Caucasian admixture. This is an example of being stuck in out of Africa too. Because you could say that Berbers, who a lot of them share the same lactose tolerance mutations, but they're not considered African ancestry. African ancestry is related more towards Sub-Saharan African. Not that that is fair, but again, there's not a real attempt to parse North African ancestry and just roll it into Africa. You don't see this with Europe. From 
the outskirts of Europe all the way to the center is considered European ancestry but with Africa North African ancestry is considered Eurasian niche I mean it's not it's it's all it's everybody's it's it's almost ignored it's also true with haplogroups a lot of those haplogroups have the their earlier branches in North Africa if you're going to be consistent about you know diversity of early branches being the, the litmus then these would be African haplogroups but the ones that are like that are not. They're usually European haplogroups. Founders affect they leave North Africa and blow up, as I've said before. But what they're saying, what they're doing is they're, um, and if you look at the bottom, you can see the study right there. The Fulani, they're, they, they list them as full, F-U-L. They have the estimated oldest instance of lactose intolerance. I couldn't track down a free version because they cite a study with the, the, um, mixture with Caucasians and Fulani so I was able to get a discord like in one of the, a um, a summary of it and in the summary it says our study does not suggest the involvement of HLAI in the higher resistance to malaria Fulani comma and confirms a low if any Caucasian component in their gene pool low if any is okay well that's what does that mean let's unpack that so looking at DNA tribes Fulani are 0.1% Caucasian that's low if any you could have looked at Kenyan Bantu because uh, Europeans tend to when you look at like admixture charts they tend to project more to Kenyan Bantu anyway and they're 0.2% Caucasian. This is the modern ancient mtDNA sequences we print here. Do not support the currently accepted hypothesis, hypothesis of a single Neolithic origin in the Near East. The process of livestock domestication and diffusion are certainly more complex than previously suggested, and our data provides some evidence in favor of our hypothesis that the origin of European cattle is multiple. Breeds domesticated in the Near East and introduced in Europe during the Neolithic diffusion probably intermixed at least in some regions with local wild animals and with African cattle introduced by maritime routes. As a consequence, European breeds should present a more diverse, important genetic resource than previously recognized. Some of these you can kind of look up. Again, what? <laughs> Just read into that. Read into that, okay? There's another study. Because that's leaving open like they don't know where their cattle came from. Like, well, I'm leaning towards the Near East, probably mixed with some African cattle and some local cattle. And, and Ray, <laughs> like, get me out of this. Subbery, man. Who, who made me write this? Uh, this is another study. You can see where it's sourced. Let me double check if this source is there. Because most of these are from like American journals and all that jazz. Let me, let me double check. Because I want to stay on the cows. I mean, if you're going to we're gonna talk lactose intolerance, we might as well get to the heart of it. And that's where these cows coming from. And there are genetic studies done on cows. The origins of these cows and they start the cows start going back to Africa too you'll see in a moment that's why you have that waffle talk yeah it's PNAS National Academy of Science and uh, you can see the title in the link for it is right there. Now in this study, it says a sample of Neolithic and Bronze Age sites in Europe display all major haplogroups found in modern cattle. T1, T, or T, T1, T2, and T3. We're talking about cattle haplogroups. If you look at the summary, it says 
that the proposal of Iberia as an entrance route for domestic cattle is supported by the presence of T1 in the data set. So they're showing that if you look at T1, that's the most common cattle haplogroup in North Africa. They're saying that's where those cattle came from. That is exactly what the summary is saying, that the cattle came from North Africa. Now the other cattle like at least the T1 cattle says, and it basically says like in the, um, that while T1 does not necessarily imply an African origin, its frequency and diversity in Africa still makes it indicative of an African marker. Now if you notice, Africa has all the cattle haplogroups, but other locations have them at a higher frequency. I think what you're seeing there founder's effect in cattle because I have to zoom it in right there and you can see all of them are in the Sudan and Upper Egypt well, actually it doesn't go down to the Sudan but all of them are in Upper Egypt all forms it looks like T1 is basically just the um, overrunning ancestry and stay with animals because you because this is all ancient technology ancient technology animals you see the same pattern with dogs okay the overall you can read this read what's underlined and tell me if this sounds familiar it says European diversity breeds but it was similar to the range of diversity observed in groups composed of European breeds indicating that the African population has maintained a large portion of the genetic diversity of the canine species as a whole. Time's out. Canine species as a whole. You can see where this is coming from. You can check the source. The genetic diversity and immunity related candidate S&P markers were similar across all three populations and to the European group. So Africa has the most genetically diverse dogs. You can see this admixture chart comparing them to European dogs. And let me let me tell you, we're talking all breeds of dogs. From the Scotland Terrier to the Bull Mastiff. Then let me show you another source, just on dogs. We're gonna get to the dog haplogroups too. We're gonna get to the dog haplogroups. You can see this study, journal PLO, a cryptic mitochondrial link between North European and West African dogs. Why has it got to be cryptic? And I read this study in July 18, and again this sounds familiar. Just look at, like at the beginning, it's like domestic dogs have an ancient origin and a long history in Africa. So they're starting off by saying, dogs came out of Africa. 345 Nigerian and 40 or 37 Kenyan dogs plus 1530 published sequence of dogs from other parts of Africa, Europe and West Asia. All Kenyan dogs can be assigned to one of three haplogroups, A, B, and C, while Nigerian dogs can be assigned to four, A, B, C, and D. This is all the haplogroups known within dogs all over the world. All the haplogroups are in Africa for dogs. That is what this is literally saying. But listen to their conclusion because they're talking about the connection with Northern European dogs and West African dogs. It says genome reveals a maternal link between modern West African and North African dogs indicated by sub haplogroup D1, but not the entire haplogroup D, coalescing around 12,000 years ago. They uh, assign this to back migration, and it makes no sense. When Africa has an ancestral D, all the diversity in dogs, but because there's a split within one aspect of D 12,000 years ago, 
their estimates. They're saying that it's a hunter-gatherer population back migrating from southern Europe. So basically with the same data, they're coming to a reverse conclusion as the cows. Back migrated dogs. I'm not buying it. Because basically European dogs carry a subclad of D. They call it D1. African dogs carry old D. You can see their model for it. I'm going to put that up. Really, I think this is basically just ignoring North African ancestry again while they're coming up with this model because they mentioned the Fulani or they mentioned the Fulani Sami connection and they're understanding the relationship with the Fulani and North Africans. That right there is probably where that split came from because all it's doing is reading a split off of D. And, and they aren't really going into the origin of European dogs. Because this is a study on the split. And it just basically identifies the split and comes up with the theory. Of, because it already said the origin. The origin is like, hey, domesticated dogs come from Africa. Forget what you've heard about the gray wolf. I want to go with goats. Yeah, I want to go with goats. So let's look at the study with Teresa... Looks like Samoes. That is not how you pronounce her name. She suggests that sheep domestication spread from the south. But then she um, she cites a study that says that it spread from the Near East. And I wonder, do they consider Algeria to be the Near East? Because that it makes you wonder. Because a lot of times in genetics, the Near East will be rolled into North Africa. I checked the first link. It showed that the ancestors of European sheep are in the Near East. But the study did not reference African sheep. Like her link that said that. They named these new pioneering sheep the Moflan. They were the, um, the wild sheep of the Near East. And, they, and in that study, they're saying that the Moflan are basically the ancestors of domesticated sheep. And this kind of reminds me of what was done with dogs, because you've probably heard that all dogs come from the Great Wolf. It reminds me of that, because recently, like just 2015, the African jackal was determined to be... I mean, and that looks like a wolf. That does not look like a jackal. They're now called golden wolves. Same species as a gray wolf. Maybe an evolved color fit. And, like, if you look at the, the phylogenetic tree for dogs, that golden jackal is older than the gray wolf. Look further at that, that phylogenetic tree and the other one. The gray wolf almost seems to be more of an uncle than an ancestor for modern, uh, modern dogs. Because even the, the wild dog of Africa is older than the gray wolf. Like, these are this, this is a phylogenetic tree that is completely different than what we were taught eight years ago if you're I'm just going by like the Discovery Channel I say what mainstream science was teaching so if you're picking that up it's changed from what it seems Stefan Copeland reported something similar about goats that the Moflon sheep were in the Sahara so I looked at wild sheep, like the ones that the other report was saying, the Near East. And I found that they had the Barbary sheep in the Sahara. You know, like the Barbary pirates, they have Barbary sheep. So I'm like, well, is, a, is this what's going on with the wolf and the jaguar? Are they the same animal? 
same sheet. So I'm, I tried to do a little research and what I found is that supposedly I'm not going to read it. It's kind of boring. And a lot of technical terms because they link. Like I look at the I list how they're linked. They're linked as um, but I mean the mouflon they got looks like they're standing in snow and the uh, African sheep's not going to see any snow. <laughs> So, <laughs> you would think they might look a little different. Uh, again, that's why both wild sheep. So, I'm like, okay, how are they different species, different genus? When did they separate? And I found a study. It's on ResearchGate. But look at this if I'm not, if I'm not sourcing it right. Because it is a, actually, that is it. It's a complete neotide. MTN, mtDNA sequence on Barbary sheep and it lists what its uh, genus and species is. So according to this to 10,000 or 9 million years ago they split from goats. 12 million years ago so we're talking a long time they split from sheep. So they are a different species. So I don't know what this dude Stefan Copeland is talking about. I'm kind of at a stalemate. Because according to him, he's saying that the Moflon exists in North Africa. Like, is he mistaking them from the Barbary sheep? What's going on? It begs the question. We have one person saying that it, it spread from the south because they're seeing a... They're seeing domesticated sheep coming from Southern Europe up. Spain, Italy, up. But the source they're citing is saying the Near East from the Mouflon. Mouflon are not located south of Europe. There's another species of sheep. Completely distant from it. Yet... You do hear or this fellow, he's saying that hey they're they're in they're in North Africa. Stefan, I think it's pronounced Kreplin. You see an out of Africa pattern there. Now give this one to the um Dabos. Tell them to explain this. You can read what that report is saying. It goes with the oldest language, so you have the exclamation point. We don't have English letters, that's a click. I have a character who has a click name in a, a screenplay that I wrote. And at one point, somebody is hyping them up, and they click real loud. Yeah, they damn near burst a uh, blood vessel clicking his name because he did something good for the people. So the Sioux has 141 phonemes and decreases as it moves to regions with less diversity. You're not seeing back migration with these languages until when? When are these languages coming back to Africa? You know, are we talking about back migration from ancient empires on? Because I'm, I'm not really disagreeing with that. That's... There's something to that. Because I had a friend who was, um, who liked Hawaiian music. Listened to a lot of Hawaiian music. And I asked him one day, are there any R sounds in your language? And it stumped him. I was surprised it stumped him. Because I'm just listening to the music. I'm hearing no R sounds. There's a blog called Niger Congo European. That's it right there. It talks about how Basque is closer to Niger Congo languages than English. Campbell Dunn wrote a book on the relationship with European and Central North African languages. Hermel Hermstein wrote a book about the relationship with Niger Congo and uh, yeah, you're you're Asian. I mean, it's Sumer, Niger Congo and Sumer. That's kind of that's more Asian. West Asian. 
Saramhotep, he's done the same thing with Middle Egyptian, Chaluba, and Sumerian recently. Even the person he debated recently, Nadardev, he's done the same thing with Egyptian and Sumerian. And I remember Joshua from Tebo Cyrus was calling the SARS work flawed because Niger Congo, according to the Greenberg model, is too distant from Sumer. Not according to Out of Africa 3. No. And really not according to the only language, African language families that I know of that have been constructed from ground up. Another thing we can maybe consider, and if you've ever played FIFA and you've had like Nigeria and Japan, you'll, you'll see a lot of the same names or close to the same names. You know, like some Akedas and Echoes. I mean, you see some of the same names with their places. So people and places similar in names compared to other people, other uh, ethnicities. Talking Nigerians and Japan, Japanese. And if you Google that, you'll see people talking about it a lot, really. You know, note that they have a similar that they're both tonal languages. They also share some words. Well, it might not be a coincidence because DE is in Nigeria. That is the ancestor for D. If you go back far enough in Japan, it'll take you to uh, Japanese genealogy. It's going to take you to people who are related to Nigerians. So we're going to get to number seven. But before I get to number seven, though, I, I do want to go with a couple more haplogroups. I want to go with both J's because it'll show how I do research. And if you're scrutinizing it, this is where, where I really need it the most. Now, if you look at this map, haplogroup J. I'm going to, I'm going to start with the paternal haplogroup J. See that the highest percentages are in Omen, Ashkenazi Jews, Saudi Arabia, Greece, Czech Republic, Uyghurs. Okay. Wikipedia does not mention the Limba. Limba people. You may have heard of them. They're uh, the Jews of Africa. Okay. Now there are other instances of of uh, haplogroup J in Africa. It's you have early branches in the Horn. I could talk about that. Matter of fact, if you're going to scrutinize the origins of J based on what I'm saying, then go there in addition to what I'm about to say about the limba, because I wanted to study the limba. You know, sometimes a half truth is just a lie. And even if it's not intentional, you're being deceived. Because Wikipedia does suggest, does cite the um, genetic tests in Limba well. It, it cites it well. It's just you have to go to that um, you have to go to that specific page but if you go to J it doesn't cite it. And then it says like the origin of their lineages talking about the Limba are out of Africa. There's some truth to that. I wouldn't rephrase it like that. Because the Limba don't have a back to Africa migration. Wikipedia also mentions that Limba were found to have T1. Now, if you look at where T1 is located on the T chart, also they don't have it from maternal lineages. Look at where T1B is. That's an early branch of T, very early. That's right at the base. It's an offshoot out the base. Now, I'm going to look at where it's located. And you're going to see exactly what's going on here. Got to zoom in. T1 Mediterranean Basin. T1B. That's the, the T haplogroup that they have. Now remember Ashkenazi, they have a lot of the L branch in proportion to other Europeans. Matter of fact, they have a, a um, L branch that is specific to them. 
I gotta check. I haven't gotten the chance to, but I wonder if that L branch with Ashkenazi is also that I figure somebody would have mentioned that, but let's look at J. Like let's cause they also find a lot of J in the limbo. Like two, it says right there that two thirds of their lineages are from out of Africa groups. So T as you can see, Mediterranean but very recent, very new T branch. Now, they went, now when they first find J in the Limba, they don't have a place for it, so they just give it a star sign, which means undifferentiated. They don't know where it is on J. It's like, this is J, we don't know. So there was a person who wanted to find out a little bit more uh, about J, and you can see the link to this study and I'm going to read a quick excerpt from that. He says, JM172 was further resolved in the subhaplogroup group J410, undifferentiated. In Rimba, South African Jews, and JM12 in Limba, Rimba, they are looking also at a neighboring tribe in South African Jews, JM410. The JM410 is mostly distributed in Anatolia, Greece, and Southern Italy. JM304 is observed in Central Asia and South Asia, particularly in the form of subclad J172, 12F2, blah, blah, blah. And they're also found among the Herero. That's an interesting connection. So they found undifferentiated, 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 J267, you can look at the, where these are located. 410, undifferentiated. These are, that's the second branch off J2. JM12, which is very rare, that's JE, and that's, from what I've seen just doing research, only located around um, uh, Greeks. So they have early Mediterranean branches. He like said there's also studies where J undifferented is high in the Horn of Africa. And its ancestor F is undifferented too. It's high in the Sudan, also the Horn of Africa. So I could get into that further. But that's what I mean. This is a pattern not of back migrated Jews. Because even the study said, hey, we don't see any Jews with this pattern. They didn't get this from Jews. It's not back migrated Jews, it's for migrated Jews indigenous African ancestry that's where it's projecting you're seeing the earliest branches in a population in South Africa you go up a little bit north you see early branches in um, in East Africa you go to the you go east of that and you see early branches in Southwest Asia with the Founders effect crossing that Red Sea, you see high frequencies there. So that's where the origin is um, expected, I guess. But like I said, J, if we're seeing early branches in South Africa and you're seeing that direction, that's not a pattern of back migration. A pattern of back migration is if they would have had recent common Jewish markers. Or at least like medieval Jewish markers. Hell, even these are older than biblical Jewish markers. Now let's let's go with mitochondrial J. Ancestors of mitochondrial J, JT, are not in modern people. In studies I've seen it's in ancient Moroccans and in ancient Etruscans, so North Africa, Southern Europe. The Moroccans, that's from the Terrafault study, or maybe it was another study with, because there was another study on Moroccans too. And that's older than the Etruscans. One thing I've noticed about Wikipedia, you have the Sicordi who have J star undifferentiated and Europeans have that and Africans it'll just say that they have J they don't put the star there and in a sense it's being dishonest but 
mitochondrial J, mtDNA J is weird. Because I looked at these sources, and I want to see if these are really I don't knows or I don't have the tools to find out. The European J star is I don't have the tools to find out because it's a study from 2000 that references samples from the 90s and they aren't listing uh, branches for any of the haplogroups. So they weren't able to identify J1, J2 regardless. So everything they get is going to be um, either J or J undifferentiated. And that means we know it's J and we think it's J. In that context, Sikorti, who was a group in Yemen, I looked at theirs and they had more precise measurements. Theirs was from 2008. The Africans, I looked at theirs and I'm actually at it. I had seen some of those, uh, and they were able to identify branches. Okay, I think. So there isn't really a hard study in what the early branches of J are. So that isn't enough to go on. No, I didn't even mention this to Clyde Winters. I'm like, and I wanted to see what he had to say about this because he's always talking about how stuff is unfair, but I never heard him mention this, like in, in population genetics. So I'm like, well, you keep saying this. Have you noticed this too? And another thing that they'll do, and I've already talked about this in another context, is they'll say something like, you see this in Wikipedia, and I'm talking about mtDNAJ that it's in 8% of ca the Caucasus, 6% of Northeast Africa. And they'll, they'll, you'll hear that without good context. Because context would imply, well, I mean, you kind of got to think, nobody really wants to live in the Caucasus. But Northeast Africa is Egypt, so there's a lot more competition in Egypt. 6% in Egypt speaks more towards an origin in that direction than 8% in the Caucasus. And these are the type of things that I wish um, people would scrutinize. Get on Wikipedia. That's why I'm trying to be that sacrificial lamb. Beat me up and say I'm wrong. Then, okay, whatever. Okay, I might, you know, whatever. But if I'm not wrong, why are we dealing with Mfondishi and not this stuff? Because this is dishonest. 8% in the caucus and then people think J came out of the caucus. And I've actually heard people say that people with J are Caucasian. Now, if you look at where J is located, it, it's in it's in Hausa. Hausa don't look Caucasian. So even if you're going by um, the archaeological or... or um, the anthropological anthropological term Caucasoid or whatever it doesn't work if you're going by region obviously it doesn't work so it's a a word used to move the goalposts and play a shell game consistently that's why I'm like okay throw this out this makes no sense but worse than that is it's being and this is that out of Africa too pigeonhole where they're not factoring the founder's effect in genetic diversity. You can't compare the Caucasus or Siberia to Egypt. If, if you're really going to run the numbers, if you're going to put percentages out, you've got to factor that this is a more hospitable environment. I'd, I'd feel better if they said, hey, we think this came from, from Sumer. So then, okay, let's let's look at Sumer and look at look at Egypt, who has early branches, because at least people are going to live near the rivers. Okay, let's get back to North Africa. Now let's let's go to let's go to phenotype. Let's 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 import some lookership, because this is important. Because when a lot of times people are not going to get past that, if they don't get past that, and if they don't get past North African ancestry, then everything I'm saying isn't going to make any sense just like with the founder's effect if you're not factoring that if you're just going by raw percentages nothing's really going to make sense you're not really scrutinizing you know and let's see this is a map we need to bring up right here these maps because we always see the skin color map i've seen brother aunt put it up a few times 
and you know, this is also for YK the truth this these maps right here they're obviously going to trump the climate map because you can have your pale skin albinos on the equator you don't want it to stick but you end up having it now if you look at these what it's showing consistently is these genes are in Africans at really low rates the genes that produce light skin and those rates start to increase before you get to Europe if you look up here because there's a there's a recent study and it showed that Africans are basically white that pretty much everybody is white underneath and then, you know if you probably heard I'm gonna bust you to the white meat it, okay it works so there's so much diversity in Africa that it's not often appreciated it's from Sarah Tishkoff. There's no such thing as an African race. We show that skin color is extremely variable on the African continent and that it is still evolving. Further, in most cases, the genetic variants associated with light skin arose in Africa. Stall me out. She is literally saying that white skin arose in Africa. Look at the palms and look at your soul so you know this to be true. It should be no surprise. The journal in the bottom right has a couple tables, I think nine if you look up. The light skin allele of SLC2485 in South Asians and Europeans shares identity by descent. Look at table nine, it shows it there. Africans have the most diversity, and that's associated with novel alleles that are only found in them with light skin. You know, it's like Dr. Henry Clark said, we out Pope the Pope, we out Muhammad, Muhammad. Genetically, you out white, white people. You out white, Europe and Asia combined. Take a look, this deals with light skin. When I saw XYY man was talking about MFSD12 allele that was associated with dark skin. He said that it was derived and it was more recent than some than um what it well basically saying it was derived would suggest that light skin is ancestral to dark skin that it's underneath kind of makes sense but my um it didn't really sit well with my pro-blackness so i had to do some research i was trying to disprove this but i didn't really have time so i had to microwave this research i was doing other stuff as you can see so I had to micro reach and I'm gonna be honest you know sometimes you just don't have the time and if you mention in the comments you're a microwave researcher because I'm being honest and telling you the truth about this and so I will Derek arm Derek Henry stiff arm you I'll block you out of the comments for that dumb stuff but all I all I really had time to do was just pose a question if MFSD12 associated with dark skin is really derived then it then you would expect it to or when it malfunctions to be then associated with vitiligo because that means you're losing your dark skin and then you would be white underneath so I just googled MFS D12 and vitiligo so I'm not arguing with it, it does appear the dark skin is derived. Nina Jablonski was right, Ankh. I'll give you that. Skin was right about one thing. Our really, really ancient ancestors, pre-homo sapien, maybe even pre-human, were white. And they weren't digging it. So they said, okay, let, let's darken it up a little bit. So, Homo sapiens left 
Africa, essentially, regardless of, of um, what was on top of them, they were white underneath. Because dark skin, it does go back, like when they trace this um, MFS D12, and they call it derived, they're not saying it's derived in Homo sapiens. They're saying it's before Homo sapiens, too. So I just want to clear that up. Day one. I mean, and even like Neanderthals have been shown to have dark skin. So this was pretty early humans. And we're saying, you know what, Let, let's, um, let's get some real sunblock going so we can modern humanize ourselves better. So you have those machinations, and that's just skin color. And then you look at the home fair skull, 36,000 years ago, South African skull. Close affinities with upper Paleolithic European skulls. I've heard people call it the Caucasian skull, but because it's in Africa, even though it's related to European skulls, similar in that regard. Some people don't like to call it the Caucasian skull. I mean, we, you know, the shell game gets moved for the Caucasian. I want to throw this out there. You know, the Tamehu with Deidre McIntyre. She didn't like that I was saying that the um, screenplay should have some relatively light-skinned Libyans um, among other uh, complexions. People will see those Libyans that are depicted in um, ancient Egypt. And I know these. this is Middle Egypt. The screenplay, Neobewa, is uh, pre-dynastic. So the Libyans aren't depicted as being that light and pre-dynastic. You know, even though that's cut in corners. But I'm, I like to um, answer clouded questions with a cloud of answers sometimes. I want to at least be mostly right. And that in the bottom right is my depiction of ancient Libyans. So, kind of mixed. As you see, they're in that area where people start lightening when they really don't need to. And what happens is it's just a diverse, they have all those novel light-skinned genes. It's a diverse mixture of those coalescing. Now in this picture... Right here, you see Khoisan, and I had to watch this video a few times to believe it. I thought the video was fake. They look so odd, so different. One of them looked like an African American. One of them looked like an old South African. The other one looks like he's some Asian dude and talks like he's some Asian dude from Canada. You know, like some mixed blacks, black Asian from Canada. And like they, they had different ways of talking that really. Uh, tripped me out and I'm, I had to watch it deeply to see if it was real or fake. I still think I might have been trolled, but I my guess was that this was real. I mean, that this is a type of diversity you see. Because wherever you go in Africa, you find people who look like people outside Africa. The machinations for Out of Africa 3 are feasible. As you see how Berbers could have split from Sahel Africans and Sahel Africans from Central Africans and Europeans from Berbers. When you look at the skin map, you have a bunch of light skin diversity and it concentrates near Tanzania, Ethiopia, and then it spreads out. And like if you go with the, the UV maps, there's probably some to that. There is a an evolution process. It's just one thing that that it shows is there it depends you know what I mean like it depends because well, let me let me get to some questions like if you look right there I think her name she's a model in the top right you also see her in the bottom middle Ethiopian albino the kids Somali albino Samburu tribe or and I think that's the Rendil in the top left. And you see the phenotype. Like I said, people from everywhere in one tribe. The guy in the bottom right is um from the Sahari tribe. Northwest Africa. 
novel light skin mutations in pygmies. Let me answer this real quick, uh, and then I want to summarize it. Because people will ask, why is it that out of Africa too sticks with all of these back migrations when there's no pattern of back migrations because you don't see until recently in colonialism um, and to a lesser extent invasions but the pattern is the older markers are in Africa spreading out the exceptions are rare to the rule so why is that? Why do we continue to go with um, the Out of Africa 2 model? Why? 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 And, and the simple answer, the simple answer, the short answer is Egypt. If you can identify any lineage that is prominent, more prominent outside of Africa as European ancestry, it doesn't matter if they are in Africa and never left Africa, you can still argue that they are not Sub-Saharan African, even in this case with the the Tufians, they are within a lineage that came out of Africa. If you could do that with the Afro Levant portion of E1B1B or U6, then you can do that with Abu Sir mummies, who are relatively close to the Tufians. Then you have the world star hip hops. Had nothing to say about Nefertiti, Queen T, King Tut, Ramses III's ancestry test but a running story saying that Egyptians are more related to Europeans than Africans, likewise with Alex Jones. That's the main reason the back migration model is clinged to, even in this case, or even, you know, like with Luxmanda burials, where you find the same Anatolian and Natufian ancestry in ancient 3000 and 6000 BC Sub-Saharan Africans. There's more to it than that, but that, that right there, that's the best I can do to answer that question, because I've had this question asked. Well, what's going on here? You know, and, it, and it's like I said, it's deeper than that. You know, like with, um, one thing I'll notice is that African um, branches will have later numbers because they're discovered later, like African haplogroup branches. That isn't like staunch, straight up racism as much as it is they're going in order of discovery. But what that does is it sets a stage so when the layman reads through Wikipedia looking at the origin of haplogroups, they have a different picture than what they would see if it was more objective. I haven't really been asked this question for this, but I get it with other videos, is people want a better summary. And I, I've given you the pieces of the puzzle, but when I say that, the, that Europeans came out of Africa in a more direct and recent sense. It goes back to Zidane. Because I would see Zidane and, and people, um, I think it was a genetic test, I was reported, would say that he's more North African than he is European. And I would look at it and I'm thinking, I need to see this test. <laughs> I got to see this test. But I was still in disbelief I was going more by lookership and I still to this day like I said I want to see this test Europeans are mainly early European farmers of the Neolithic as opposed to Western European hunter-gatherers in ancient North Eurasian paleos within the range of the estimated age of haplogroups usually the younger end of the estimation you will see in the phylogenetic trees that these haplogroups like E1B1B, R, H, V, paternal J, arguably mitochondrial J, these lineages pit stop in North African populations before entering the Mediterranean. That's why you see the majority of EF is in Southern Europe, Malta, Spain, Greece, and Turkey. In Turkey, that's who the Ashkenazi Jews are more related to. That's why when Helen Thomas says the Jews of Israel are European, she's absolutely right. Ashkenazi are generally Turks, mostly Turks. 
They had the cows, the lactose intolerance, the dogs, the goats, the doctors, the medicine, the bell beaker huts that I didn't talk about. Actually, I don't think they had the... That's more West Europe. I could have gotten the bell beaker. But these samples on the right are from Iberia. Tor, Taf should be on the map as dark skin. Iom is Morocco. Cab is recent 3000 BC Morocco with K1, T2, and X2 hapo groups. K1, T2, and X2. Okay. All are basal Eurasian haplogroups living in Africa from which they came because there's no pattern of back migration. They, and Keb has medium pigment genes in hot-ass Morocco. You don't need the crazy vitamin D theories. Because <laughs> these people were eating fish. I'd be willing to bet they were eating fish. But you had diverse coalescing of light skin genes, just like the albinos on Panama. Where, again, it's hot. As you can see, that the Moroccans that don't have future contact with Europeans like Torfal and IAM, they default to yellow, a North African Maghreb ancestry located within Africa. It's as simple as easy as that. Early Europeans are connected to Homo sapiens mostly through this ancestry. I talked about the misinformation in population genetics. I use angel as an example, who misuses the word Caucasian. Another example would be ACBN, who always talks about how there's no such thing as white Africans, when technically speaking, blah, blah, blah. I just went over that. Or they'll call East Africa miscegenation zone instead of Arabia. Not sure about that. Recommended videos where I show how Neanderthal admixture did not occur. I gave an overview for the different out of Africa models. I gave an example of how population genetics identifies populations differently, how net geo and DNA tribes disagree on population ancestries, namely modern Egypt, Senegal, the Luya, and North Africa. There's no reason for people to have left Africa, traveled thousands of years in some fictional Caucasian land, mutated and traveled back. You have people who will go in on the abos for basically the same thing as out of Africa too. I mean, if you're going to say people, if you know, like if Africans can go all the way to America, whatever cold climate, mutate and return with Q, X, and R, that's just as much of a stretch as saying that Africans came from the Americas in the first place. At least it's one direction. Okay, Africans came from the Americas and went, uh, <laughs> you know, that's one, one sentence. Out of Africa, too, would suggest that if you find Q in Africa, that even if it's way out in Algeria, that Africans went all the way <laughs> to America and came back. Same with X, same with R, because there's, same with uh, mitochondrial A. Like Professor Arneson, he'll find like a 75,000 year old wrist and say, like, this is a modern wrist, modern homo sapien wrist, and he'll, he'll find it in Turkey. And then he'll write an out of Eurasia paper, and Dr. Ali Muhammad will source it, like he did in that debate with Jabari. So, top to bottom, Black YouTube supports out of Africa too. Even though, if you look at it, it's making claims that are just as wild as Arneson and the Abos with back migration. And it's not looking at the age, therefore, because it, you, if you, you can't do one without the other, if you're saying that these aren't back migrated, then it has to change the age of out of Africa migrations. So you'll hear people say that humans or Homo sapiens left Africa a hundred and a hundred and fifty thousand years ago. Huh? Like that's what I've heard recently. 
when if you're looking at the age of these migrations without unnecessary back mig migrations then they have to be a lot younger and if they're younger then it does pose the question 